Good evening. It is Thursday, June 10th at 5 p.m. This is a meeting of the City of Albuquerque Civilian Police Oversight Agency Board. Um, my name is Eric Olivas. I'm the chairman of the board, and I'm going to go ahead and call this meeting to order. Present here with us tonight from the board, we have Vice Chair Chantel Galloway. We have uh, member Doug Mitchell. We also have member Eric Nixon, member Tara Armijo Pruitt, uh, member Gion Ralph, and I believe we also have member Richard Johnson here tonight um, from the board. Uh, we also have uh, an observer. We have a new uh, board member, Ms. Patty French, who will be attending the meeting tonight as a, an observer is required by our uh, ordinance. And then from the Civilian Police Oversight Agency, we have Director Ed Harness, uh, admin staff Valerie Barella and Katrina Sigala. We have um, CPOA, CPOAB legal counsel, Tina Gooch. And then from the city of Albuquerque, we have Superintendent uh, Sylvester Stanley, uh, with uh, CPCs, we have Kelly Mensa from the City of Albuquerque uh, City Legal. I believe we have Carlos Pacheco, um, Pastor David Walker from the Mayor's Office, uh, Zach Cottrell with uh, APD, Commander Corey Lowe also with APD. And uh, sorry, I'm looking around my screen here for others. Um, uh, Chris Sylvan with City Council, um, Melissa Coons with City Legal, Elizabeth Martinez with DOJ. Uh, and <clears throat> I'm sorry, I'm not, not familiar. Um, Mark, I'm sorry if I mispronounce your name, Martessa Billy. I'm not sure uh, what department you're representing. I apologize for not knowing. Uh, I'm Martessa Billy, and I'm the office assistant with the CPOA, and I work with the CPC. Oh, great. The Community Policing Council. Welcome. It's great to great to meet you, and uh, I apologize for mispronouncing your name, but thank you for joining us, and thank you for uh, for joining the team. Thank you. Uh, introductions aside, here we'll go ahead and move on to item number two: the mission statement of the Civilian Police Oversight Agency Board is advancing constitutional policing and accountability for APD and the Albuquerque community. Item number three: we have uh, our agenda. The agenda was. Uh, distributed in advance of the meeting. Are there any, uh, is there a motion to approve the agenda? I move to approve the agenda. Second. We have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion on the agenda? Uh, I'd actually like to make an amendment to the agenda I'm, and I'll defer to our admin staff on this if it had been corrected, but I believe that uh, case 031-20 should have been 031-21. Was that corrected or does that need to be corrected in the, in the amendment? Eric, I think that needs to be um, corrected. Okay, so I would make an amendment to uh, strike 031-20 and insert 031-21. Second that amendment. We have a motion in a second. Any discussion? Ms. Borrella, could you please call the roll? Member Armio Pruitt? Yes. Member Galloway? Yes. Member Johnson? Yes. Thank you. Member Mitchell? Yes. Member Nixon? Yes. Member Olivas? Yes. Member Rell? Yes. Okay. Uh, amendment passed 7 0. Thank you. That brings us to the uh, original motion to adopt the agenda with the amendment made. Are there any further amendments or changes that we need to make tonight? Seeing none, uh, feel free to interrupt me if, if there is. Otherwise, uh, Ms. Barella, could you please call the roll? Yes, member Amio Pruitt. Is that a yes, member Amio Pruitt? Yes. Thank you, member Galloway? Yes. Thank you. Member Johnson? Yes. Member Mitchell? Yes. Member Nixon? Yes. Member Olivas? Yes. Member Rell? Yes. That motion passed 7 0. Thank you. That completes business on item number three. We move on to item number four, which is public comment. The board has received two public comments from Ms. Geraldine Amato. Those were distributed to the board members prior to the meeting 
board members have reviewed those comments and uh, thank you for your comment. There any further action on this item? Seeing none, item number five is review and approval of the minutes from the May 20, 2021 meeting. Um, those minutes were distributed in a link that was uh, in the original um, email for this meeting. And those are also available on the website within 10 days of the meetings uh, happening. Do we have a motion? Motion to approve the minutes. Uh, I'll second that. Any discussion? Seeing none, Ms. Barilla, could you please call the roll? Member Amio Pruitt? Yes. Member Galloway? Yes. Member Johnson? Yes. Member Mitchell? Yes. Member Nixon? Yes. Member Olivas? Yes. Member Rell? Yes. And that motion passed 7 0. Thank you. That completes action on item number five. We move on to item number six which is reports from city departments. Uh, our first item in this uh, with APD, there are gonna be three reports. The first report will be the IA Professional Standards Division, SOPs uh, in this area, SOP 7-1, SOP 3-41, and SOP 3-46. Commander Cotterell. Uh, good evening, President Olivas and members of the board. Um, the report for IAPS for May was distributed to everyone. I'll go over the numbers real quick. Um, we did close out 16 cases in the month of May uh, where the discipline was imposed and those cases are listed below uh, with the findings and discipline was assigned to each um, case. Um, we did close out 22 cases within IAPS in the month that are sent out to area commands for their review and final imposition of discipline. Um, we did open up an additional 23 cases in May, um, which seems to be about average over the last six months when I did compare it. Um, so we're staying kind of flat right there, which is good. Um, area command cases for the month of May that were opened up, those are the minor misconduct cases that do go out um, to 35, uh, which seems to be average as well um, over the last six months. It has peaks and valleys. It's kind of uh, weird to see the trend in those cases um, where they do go up and down um, but do seem to be right around 30 uh, on, on average. Um, I know last meeting I had talked about um, an increase in cases that we had closed out um, year to date um, over the previous year. And I told you I was gonna kind of look into that because I knew there would be questions as why and what trends I was seeing there. Um, a big trend I did notice um, once I actually started looking into it a little bit more is um, Investigations that have stayed within IEPS um, year to date was 94 um, compared to same year to date in 2020, which was only 46. Um, so we pretty much doubled our caseload within IEPS in the last year. Um, so I did look into that to see if there was anything major there. Uh, what it appears to be is um, better intake screening on our part as the complaints come in um, from supervisors or um, other officers, employees um, on what we're keeping here. Um, we also are keeping anything with progressive discipline where the uh, employee has any history of prior discipline um, that could be used for progressive discipline. We are keeping within internal affairs now, um, which before, if it was still just possibility of a reprimand, either verbal or written, we were sending it back to the area commands. Uh, we are now keeping those cases with any possible um, suspension because of progressive discipline within IEPS. Um, so we are seeing a big uh, number increase in our cases because of that. Um, another number I kind of thought was funny or was a little um, alarming was um, percentage of sustained cases so far this year is 60% um, compared to 44% last year. So uh, we have more sustained findings than we did a year ago. Um, I think a lot of that is due to better investigations. Um, I have better experienced investigators now than what I did a year ago. Um, so I think we're just digging a little deeper into cases than just what was on face value before. So our cases are getting a little uh, more in depth and a little, little bit better. And so our findings seem to be a little bit more consistent. Um, so we do have an increase in sustained findings. Um, that's all I have for this week. And if anyone has any questions.
Any questions from the board? Uh, I do have one question for you. Uh, are you hiring or using uh, any civilian investigators in your in your area? So the plan was when we posted those civilian openings um, about six weeks ago, the Internal Affairs Force Division would get nine and I would get two. Uh, so the hope was that we would have 11 get through interviews. Um, we were not able to get that many through interviews. Uh, five is all that we were able to get through and hire. Um, so Force took all five of those. Um, we did repost those. Uh, I believe there's three that we still have to interview, if I'm correct on that, Commander Lowe. Um, four. Um, so maybe out of that group, I will try and steal one civilian investigator to assist me with our caseload, just because it has increased from about six per, per detective to 11 right now is our kind of holding pattern for number of cases per detective. Great, thank you for that information. Yes, sir. Anything further from the board? Seeing none, I appreciate your time, Commander Cottrell, and we'll go ahead and complete item number one, A, A1. Moving on to item number two, the IA Force Division, SOPs 2-52 through 2-57, Commander Coilo. Good evening. Chair Olivas and members, um, thank you for the time for this last month of May 2021. Uh, there were 76 total uses of force for level ones, 22, level twos, 39, level threes, 15. We did have um, the highest number in the Southeast where they had level twos of 12, and the level three of two, so we have, um, which is pretty normal for them. For the force types, it remains the same. Um, disturbances um, are more likely to result in the use of force, along with family dispute, assault and battery, or suspicions, persons, or vehicles. So those are consistent in previous months. We do have our last 12 months of force data. Um, you can see that there was a decrease in uses of force for foothills. Northwest, Southeast, and Valley. Southwest stayed the same and Northeast, uh, I'm sorry, yes, Northeast is the one that went up this month. Um, that is my report for this month and I will stand for any questions. Any questions from the board? Uh, seeing none, one more time here, one more pass, seeing no questions. Thank you, Commander Lowe, for your report. And that will go ahead and conclude item two on APD reports. Item number three is um, a special presentation that we've asked the K-9 unit to give us some information on the work that they do there and specifically how uh, that work relates to uh, use of force incidences and uh, some of the related issues that the board sees. So I did provide some, some um, questions or guiding questions to, to these gentlemen prior to the meeting. And uh, hopefully this will be informative for, for all members as we, uh, as we are now beginning to review serious use of force cases and, and uh, several of them have, have included canine uh, deployments. So tonight uh, those SOPs include SOP 2-23, 1-64, 1-92 and 2-20. And we have with us uh, Lieutenant Ray Del Greco and Sergeant Michael Hernandez. Good evening. Uh, thank you all for having us. Appreciate uh, the time. My name is Ray Del Greco. I'm the Lieutenant of the Special Operations Division Tactical Section. So I oversee SWAT, K-9, uh, EOD, CNT, and TEMS. And this is Michael Hernandez. He's the Sergeant of the K-9 Unit. So as many of you all in the Police Oversight Board are aware, we've gone through some significant strides within the K-9 Division as far as deployments are concerned. And we've, I think we've kind of come to a point now where um, we've got a good solid basis on deployments, uh, how a PS, a police service dog is used, when it's used, when it's not used. Um, I think the, the board were wrapping up some provisions for a new policy um, that we're going to be putting rolling out here pretty soon for the canine unit. 
Um, and in that, Sergeant Hernandez will go more in depth on some of the handling and deployment criteria for the canine unit. But just to give the board some statistical information, so canine apprehensions in 2020 resulting in injury were 26, I believe. Um, we've had three now going through the half, first half essentially of 2021. So, I mean, nearly a, a 80% reduction, I believe. I'd, somebody would have to check my math on that, but um, we're still, getting the non-injury apprehensions, which means the police service dog is being used to locate an individual who um, human means might not be necessarily able to contact, um, but we're reducing the apprehension, injury apprehension rate significantly. Um, and we're ensuring that when we are having injury apps there for violent offenders um, and it's the, the, the dog is used as a tool for its purpose rather than just a, a force option for um, apprehension. Okay. With, sorry, go ahead. Um, so with, with like, sorry. <laughs> with a, as Lieutenant stated, so, um, and of course, feel free to ask, ask any questions um, while I talk. Um, as you know, our use of force reporting is a canine apprehension with injury is a level three which automatically IFD will respond. Um, the police service dog is the only tool that we can actually deploy, however, recall back. And what I mean by recall back is we can deploy the police service dog and we can tell him to come back at any point in time to say, hey, if that person gives up or say we don't need to deploy that as an option because he surrendered. Um, so that's the only any the weapon. So any other impact tools like your taser, your beanbag, your 40, or even your, your handgun or rifle, you pull the trigger, it's not coming back. So that's one of the benefits that having a police service dog. One, we're able to recall that force option that we possibly are going to tend to use. And then also is um, for the time and distance. And we use our dog for the time and distance to create um, better advantages for us. So we can one, either deescalate um, into a peaceful surrender. And prior to every deployment, uh, we're using canine warning announcements. So for say, if we go into a commercial business that had been broken into, prior to our deployment, we're gonna give loud warning announcements to give any possible person that is inside there a possible chance to surrender. And that goes same thing with an area search. If someone runs from police and they're hiding in the neighborhood, um, we give those over PAs and we make sure that every corner of that perimeter, they're able to hear those and we give ample amount of opportunity for that individual, if he is hiding, to surrender. And of course, we're using our dogs as a locating tool to create that time and distance. Um, as Lieutenant stated, uh, we have approximately, um, to date, we have three apprehensions with injury. Um, they're about, they're down from last year um, and our apprehensions are actually up um, with non-injuries. So we're about 39 for the year and we only have three apprehensions with injuries. And those are a part of us using those announcements better and other using de-escalations. So as one of your questions has stated, um, for de-escalation methods, the police service dog is not, very, is not used as a de-escalation method um, other than the announcements. Um, you know, some could say by get our warning announcements could de-escalate the situation knowing that, hey, that we're going to use a police service dog to locate them. And there is a high likelihood that when their announcements are given, that the person does surrender. Now, there is individuals that are willing to hide because they don't think the police service dog can find them. However, if, if you are in the area, they're going to find them. They're, they're, they're great tools. And then to answer your question about um, training requirements. So as a new handler, when you come to the unit, first you have to do all the requirements of testing um, and getting onto the team. Um, but once you join the team, we send, we send them to a basic handler course out in Riverside, California for six weeks. And that's where they get the basic fundamentals and they get the certification. However, we're unique with our mission. So when they come back, they are certified However, we put them through about a 
three to four month OJT process. And um, when I say three to four months, it depends on the handler and the dog, because depending on the experience of the dog and how old it is, every dog is different, every handler is different. But there is a certain criteria that we do have to meet with obedience um, and also with directionals when we're searching. They have to be able to perform those tasks, just like if you just came out of the academy. Each phase is broken down to zero phases where um, is where they shadow. Then the first phase is when they're basic. Well, the first phase is before they go to school. They kind of shadow. And then when they do come back, they're in phase one, which lasts a couple of weeks where they're actually watching the handler, uh, a, uh, an experienced handler that's on the team, and they watch them do searches. And then after a certain period of time, they go to um, a second phase where they have, to they have to do the searches after the handler completes it. So once, say for instance, we go to commercial building, the handler, the experience handler will run it. And then after that, they will search that same building and ensure that everything has been cleared and they systematically search it with their police service dog to get experience. Because we can't put an unexperienced dog into a building without them be passing OJT. So that's kind of the phases that we do go. And then of course, on the third phase is they're pretty much doing everything and responding to everything. Um, however, um, once they complete the certain amount of building searches and tasks, they're, they're now on their own. And then of course, they're evaluated for the first year that they're in. Um, as far as um, any ongoing training, we do weekly training. So weekly training, we have um, by federal law, there's um, 16 hours a month that have to be that have to be training within the department. However, we go above and beyond that, and we actually train anywhere from about 40 to 60 hours of um, individual training. That does not include um, individual time. So each handler on a weekly, on a daily basis, trains on their own probably for about an hour a day with their dog, either doing its obedience. Um, any sort of uh, physical activity, running, but that's, that's all with uh, toy work. Um, and, and as far as um, bite ratios. So right now our bite ratio is at 3% for the past six months. And so how they're calculated per the cost is, it's a rolling six month calendar. So every six months, each officer um, has a bite ratio and then there's a team bite ratio. Our team bite ratio is at 3.2% from the month of December to May. Um, and then of course, if there is a handler that goes over the 20%, then that's when a Lieutenant has to do an evaluation to say, okay, why is his bite ratio higher than the 20% threshold? And um, wh what other aspects is there? Is there a deficiency in the dog? Is there a, a pattern of conduct on the handler and the dog? Or is it just the fact that you know, there was an opportunity where he had, you know, um, multiple apprehensions with injuries. So there's a lot that play, but um, there's a lot of big process and oversight that we do to ensure that all working teams are effective and are properly trained and are working um, properly. Um, as far as, uh, as a criteria for deployment, so in our 2-23, it's for mainly for the field requirements. So the majority of our work is we're single purpose. So we're apprehension dogs. So for that instance, it's um, anytime a, a suspect either flees on foot or um, actually like commits a felony crime when flees on foot or actually breaks into a building or say that. So we are mainly used for area searches, uh, building searches residential searches if they believe someone inside and then also for the SWAT activation stuff. Um, for the instance where it doesn't rise to the level of a felony, uh, we will do a muzzle search, which means the dog has a, a leather muzzle and it cannot actually bite the individual. Um, those are for instances where say there's a vacant building or there's um, an open door and there hasn't been a crime of burglary inside that store or that business um, for that, that instance. Um, does anyone have any questions so far? I know I'm going kind of quick, but I just want to make sure no one has any questions. I have one question. If that's yes, sir. 
Uh, one of the cases that we reviewed, uh, use of force cases, which was 1963-89, and it basically was an intoxicated woman who wouldn't exit her home and ended up hiding in her closet. The dog was deployed. In, in reviewing the OBRD, it seemed like um, the handler was trying to call the dog off, and the dog didn't seem to be responding. Now, I don't speak the language, so I'm not sure that that's what was happening, but that's what it appeared to happen. And that, and I was wondering, was that because either the dog wasn't responding or because the offender was kicking and resisting? So um, at any time when we recall the dog, I think for that instance, if I'm remembering correctly, it was um, female hiding in the closet. It was a SWAT activation, right. if, I, if, I'm, if I'm correct. So what happened on that call is um, a female actually threatened her daughter with um, with a knife or some sort of object. Right. Uh, went into a SWAT activation where she barricaded. Um, we threw hours and hours of negotiations with her and she refused. And then we deployed chemical munitions. So our police service dog on a SWAT activation, it's the last resort. So at that point, um, I did review that case. Um, and actually what the handler was saying was a port. So what a port means it, it, the lady was hiding under a bunch of clothes. Mm -hmm. So we couldn't clear her hands. So what the handler was telling is to try to pull her out in order to see her hands in order for us to safely clear her hands and take her into custody. So um, the handler wasn't calling her, calling the dog off and not listening. It was, it was the port command telling the dog a assist in pulling her out so that we can clear her hands. And then they were able to take her in custody. But um, one thing that we do use is the dog as a last resort is because it's more safely, more safe than for us to manually search because of course the hum the, our human scent is not as great as the dog scent. So we use that as a last resort. And the only time we deploy and in going into a residence is that all means have, have failed. The chemical munitions, um, the robot couldn't find her. So we do a lot more things in order to try to safely take them into custody instead of the, using the dog as a last resort. Okay, thank you. I just was confused by what the command was. And so, and, and so majority of our dogs, um, we have Dutch commands and we have German commands and we have Czech commands. So those are the three main really um, languages that we use um, in order for the dog to um, obey our commands. Okay, thank you. So right quick, um, Sergeant Hernandez mentioned the oversight for canine handlers who exceed the 20% bite ratio within uh, the confines of the settlement agreement. So for me as a lieutenant, we just, I just did one a couple days ago. Um, I review their internal affairs file. I look for any patterns or practices of behavior that may indicate that uh, the officer is headed towards a downward spiral or maybe using his police service dog in some sort of inappropriate fashion due to stimulus outside of the job um, or even inside due to, you know, extensive discipline. Um, I review their work performance plans. I review their handler logbook and I review, um, Dagum, there's another thing that I review. Reports. What's that? Reports. Their, their reports. Go through all of the information that I can on the handler to ensure that there's no, again, pattern and practice of using the PSD inappropriately or out of policy um, and ensure that, like in this case, uh, it was due to the ratio between the non-apprehension, ap the non-injury apprehensions and the injury apprehensions. So this officer had five Total apprehensions, four of those were non-injury and one of them was injury. So due to the low numbers, just by the math alone, it led to the 25%. So we have to take a look at those things uh, just to ensure that we're you know, staying within the confines of the settlement agreement. And there was no issue in this case other than just a lack of non-injury apprehensions. Um, criteria for deployment. Again, uh, as Sergeant Hernandez alluded to, 
one of the uh, we've we've significantly modified the criteria for deployment as far as when we'll deploy, whether it be muzzled or unmuzzled with the PSD. Again, when we'll have uh, a commercial business with no responsible party present and um, the building needs to get cleared due to clear signs of forced entry, we'll have a muzzle on the PSD. So in case it finds somebody and we're not able to completely satisfy, satisfy statutory requirements for a felony crime, that we, we have a non-injury apprehension. Um, and so that's the purpose for that. Um, so they'll, they'll deploy for, again, any commercial building with signs of forced entry. Um, they'll deploy for area searches. They'll deploy and on SWAT activations. Uh, and then as Sergeant Hernandez alluded to earlier, our SWAT activation deployments, it's the last possible it's a, it's the last the least means or the last tool in our tool bag to use when all the other means to get the individual into custody or locate the individual have been exhausted. So uh, we're now also working hard. Director Harness knows this better than anybody of trying to give canine warning announcements before we deploy into specific areas. So if we we will give general PA announcements. Uh, through an area search, but then if we find an area where an individual may be located, we'll give additional canine warning announcements, um, which go above and beyond constitutional requirements to ensure that the individual has given every opportunity to surrender before the use of the police service dog to try and locate him uh, or, or, or that person. So um, those are some of our, our uh, criteria for deployment. Um, the last two claims for risk management occurred from my understanding in 2019. Uh, one claim was as a result of a female who opened the door to the canine vehicle um, and uh, just thought it was a pet and the PSD ended up taking a, a nip in at her wrist. Um, there was an injury there that resulted in a risk management claim and then there was a um, just a, a mistaken target lock identity from the PSD which resulted in another um, risk management claim, but those were the only two in 2019. We haven't had one since then. Um, some of the things that we can expect uh, or you all can expect in the new canine policy, uh, which was written and is waiting for review, um, is just a much clearer policy. I think 223 leaves a, a lot to the imagination, which is um, not necessarily appropriate with canine policy. So you're going to find clear criteria on when the dog can be deployed, when it cannot be deployed, um, requirements for field service bureau personnel, and ensuring that we have reasonable suspicion or probable cause that a felony crime had occurred before we deploy the PSD um, unmuzzled for any purpose. So that's going to be coming out here pretty soon. Um, and um, with that, if, does anybody have any other further questions? Is there any anything that we need to clarify as far as the canine unit is concerned? I know the board has, um, has seen some of our work product back in 2020 um, with the use of layered response. Um, that's something that SOD has addressed as well. And that kind of was part and parcel of just not having a full understanding of the use of force policy and minimum necessary, reasonable and proportionate. So we would deploy multiple force options in a compressed time frame to include a PSD without giving the individual that we were engaging with the opportunity to see if one or other force options would work before the deployment of the next one. So we've cleaned that up. Um, we ensure that we utilize force options. We assess their effectiveness to before deploying other force options. Um, for the most part, um, you know, we're able to get to a level where we gain compliance with our force deployment and then force stops. Um, so we've, we've definitely eliminated a lot of that. So the board um, can rest assured that layered response is um, almost a, 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 a scarlet letter on this division anymore, that term. So, um, so yeah, I stand for questions if anybody has anything or if I can clarify anything for any of you all.
be more than happy to. Member Armijo Pruitt. Thank you. Um, thank you both for presenting all this information. It's very um, helpful. Um, I have a couple of questions. One, I, I was wondering if, if basically a non-muzzled deployment of a service dog, is that basically going to be an injury, um, an injury case? Like how often do you deploy a dog without a muzzle and there isn't an injury as a result? Um, there's, there is a lot of, there is instances, I don't have the exact number of how many, um, but there is, there is instances where, you know, someone might be hiding behind a door or, um, and, you know, our dog indicates on that door or, you know, we deploy muzzle, then they surrender during the search. Um, so there is that chance. Is there a higher likely chance? that the dog is gonna injure someone? Yes, um, a lot of that is you know, based on the individual. If he's you know, actively hiding or fighting or trying to flee when the police service hawk does contact them. Um, so it, it, all, it all depends on the circumstances of that individual. However, if we do start searching and we see the individual, we're gonna give that individual every opportunity to surrender prior to us redeploying that dog. Um, and then for instances where they do indicate um, but our dog cannot get to them. Once again, we're going to recall our dog, make sure we have control, and then advise that suspect, hey, our dog has located you. You need to come out and exit. I have control of my dog. Um, so that sort of things. So at every moment of the search, we're still giving that opportunity for them to surrender. And as far as the non-muzzled, um, so <clears throat> when the dog is deployed non-muzzled, um, there are, it's not a guarantee that you're going to have an injury. So um, if the dog locates, like Sergeant Hernandez said, uh, they'll do what's called a garden bark um, if available, if they'll indicate to a scent odor. And again, like Sergeant Hernandez said, they're not able to get to them. They'll indicate where in the proximity of the building or structure or area they're in. Um, and then officers will start to kind of target in on that area and begin to give commands and those types of things. So, um, and we only consider we categorize injuries, obviously, when, when the PSD makes contact with the individual, so. Sure. Thank you. That's much okay. clearer. Um, I, another question, and this is just um, sort of my own curiosity. The foreign language commands, is that to avoid interference from others in trying to control the animal? No, actually, we get, we get all our police service dogs imported from Europe. Oh, okay. And of course, okay. In, in Europe, they have a lot more stringent um, breeding processes. And so it's, they go through a lot more, um, of course, titles and other things. And they're more, and they're more, um, I would say stringent on that. And so when they come over here, we know that where they come from, where their genes, you know, where their fathers and majority of the time, their whole entire family or the litter, I would say, is coming from police service dogs or working dogs, um, not just you know breeding this dog for this dog. So that's why we go over there. Gotcha, thank you for that. And then my final question, um, I think Lieutenant, when you were talking about you know looking at a specific example of someone whose file you were looking at and they had a low number, um, I was kind of wondering about, or maybe that wasn't the thing we were talking about, I'm sorry. What, do, what happens when you have multiple, so you have, three people in an area and, you know, one's uh, someone who's, who's committing a, a, a crime and the others are sort of just in the area. The dog, how does, how is that handled with the dog? Like if you didn't expect there to be three people around that corner and, and there are, um, the dog is, is trained to do what? Do they guard and bark on the group? So, so before any deployment, so for instance, if, if an individual runs and jumps into a residential area, before we even deploy into the, the homeowner's yard is we're gonna contact that homeowner and we're gonna contact them and say, hey, you know, it's our Albuquerque Police Department. We're gonna utilize our police service dogs. Is there anyone in, in your backyard that you're aware of? Do you have pets prior to us deploying in there? Because if we do not make contact with them, the likelihood of the homeowner coming out is high and of course our dogs can't um differentiate from you know is this a 
bad person or this is a good person. How how they search and how they're they're grown up is they're in a pack, right? So by us searching close to the dog and realizing is saying, okay, this is where you know the handler, his dad is. Um, so we're gonna ensure that everyone out in front of us or is around us ensure that they're not the ones that are supposed to be in there. And so that's where our, our warnings come in. That's where we advise the neighborhood that we're gonna search for police with our police service dogs. So to make sure that your doors are locked, your windows are locked. And if you do have an emergency, dial 911 and do not exit your home until um, you're told to, which is over to the PA. So yes, there is things that we, we have to do as handlers in order to prevent that accidental bite of an individual that's not supposed to. And then of course, there is this scientific topic where it has been done and I've seen it is where a dog, say a homeowner comes out and the dog runs right by him. A lot of times it's a fear scent of, of, a, of a suspect where they're sweating. They have a different type of odor than just us, the handlers or someone that's nonchalantly in the area. And I've seen it firsthand is some, I don't know how it happens, but some dogs just go right by them and they don't even worry about them. Um, so I can't, I'm not a scientist, but I've been, I've been told that and I've seen it firsthand, so. Thank you very much. Anything further from the board? Uh, Vice Chair Galloway. Thank you, Chair Lewis. Thank you, gentlemen, for your presentation. Um, the majority of the use of force cases that we're seeing have been with canine um, deployments. Is a more um, thorough training or experience with you all, like if we were to go to the canine academy or, or the canine unit and do kind of a ride along with you all, would that be something that would be too um, too much of an interruption for the dog? I know that we're, we're dealing with more than just humans if we do that. So would That's, that be too disruptive to your, to your service dogs to kind of visit with you all and have more time to no. get a feel for what's going on? No, um, that's not, of course, you know, we just can't come and pet the dogs, you know. Sure. And some dogs are different than other dogs. A majority of our dogs are social. Um, I mean, if, if you're asking, we do a presentation to the um, Citizen Police Academy every single time. Um, we do a bite demonstration. Um, we talk about really in depth of, you know, the history of the canine unit and what has evolved. We bring in the dogs, talk about the dogs, um, you know, and we show obedience. So that's something that, yes, if the board is interested, we can set that up um, for a future down the road. Um, but yeah, I don't think that's going to be a disruption to okay. know. And, and of course, for us, just like anything else, we would like everyone to learn because not a lot of people know about the dogs. A lot of times they think it's just a dog. Um, and sometimes they, they, they forget the emphasism of, of the police service dog and how of a great tool they are for us and how much they save lives and save times for us because of their senses. So, but yes, that's something that Lieutenant <clears throat> can, can probably work with the board too. Yeah, I think that, I mean, for me, I think a demo would be more appropriate than just ride alongs. I think you guys would, um, the board would, you just kind of, you're kind of at the mercy of the call volume at the, on the, on the night for a, for a ride along versus a demo, you get a more holistic approach. You'd be able to see some of the obedience training that the handlers do a lot of the, you know, bite suit work, apprehension work, searching work, all of those types of things can be done in a demo environment versus an auto ride along. And that would be perfectly fine as well. And please forgive me if the way that I worded my question was confusing. Um, I just don't know. I don't know if other board members have the same, um, feel the same kind of sense of urgency to learn more about the training, the use, the, the deployment and recall of the animal and how that all works. But I certainly do, given that that's 
the majority of what we're looking at with these course cases. So if a demo would be more appropriate, maybe we can work collectively to find a time to meet with you all. Um, I think that's important, but I didn't want to speak for everybody else. So. Sure. And we can set it up, um, you know, we could it would take a decent chunk of the day, but we do, we do a demo with canine and then um, we can also do some chemical munition, NFDD, some of the other tools and tactics that we use, not only within canine, but in SWAT, um, show you the EOD robot, our drone uh, system, just kind of give you a holistic approach of the tactical section, what we do, the, the techniques and capabilities that we have uh, for the board. I think that would be helpful. Absolutely. I didn't get that as part of my police academy experience. I didn't get any of that. So I certainly would welcome that opportunity. Sure. Thank you, gentlemen. You're welcome. And I, I did just want to, uh, I, I don't mean to say correct you, Member Galloway, but um, the reason that most of the use of force cases we're seeing are canine cases is because we have had some, uh, some hangups with the um, shooting cases. So um, it, I don't, I don't want to misrepresent that, that it's somehow that we're seeing more uses of force with canine. It's just that proportionally those are, we're seeing more of those because uh, we're not reviewing or, or we're in the very early stages of reviewing uh, cases involving uh, more lethal uses of force. But all those means you mentioned uh, chemical munitions, we've seen some of that, uh, 40 millimeter canine, all that kind of thing. But uh, I think canines tended to be the, probably the most common one for whatever reason. So. Anything further from the board? Gentlemen, I think uh, we, we leave here far better informed and uh, appreciate your time and, and your patience with us. And uh, I think that, that we'll, we'll definitely follow up with you in the near future um, to, to see if we can set something up to, to give us some better training and, and more insight on, on how you all use those tools and how you're trained so that we can make informed decisions as we look at those cases. Great. Thank you all for having us. We appreciate the time. Thank you. Uh, that concludes item A, uh, reports from APD. Uh, item B, is, uh, City Council, Mr. Chris Sylvan. Thank you, Chair Olivas. Good evening, board. Uh, Chris Sylvan with the City Council. Um, short report tonight, so Monday's council meeting, the council, of course, approved newest board member, Patty French for your board. And she is of course the final appointee and that brings your membership up to nine, which is great. It's been a long process getting that done. Um, council will also be holding a special city council meeting on June 17th to discuss the update of the integrated development ordinances. That'll be at 3 p.m. And the June 21st council meeting will be the final meeting before the council takes its July recess. I did hear something that there's a possibility that council may start meeting in person in August. Um, details will follow next month. I, the first meeting after the break is August 2nd. So with that, I stand for any questions. <clears throat> Looking one more time here at the board, seeing no hands. Uh, that concludes item B. Mr. Sylvan, you're up again on item C, the Public Safety Committee of the City Council. You have anything to report there? I'm sorry, I raised oh, my hand right. a little bit. Right. I have a real quick question, Mr. Sylvan. If they, when they do return in person, will they still be um, making um, at-home viewing possible? I guess that was already a, an option, right, through Job TV? Um, Chair Levis, board member Amijo Pruitt, I just read the email from our director and he's he just sent it to me like 15 minutes ago and everything's still being worked out. So I can have a better answer for you on that question next month. And I'm sure that we will continue in this sort of Zoom capacity for the future. Thank you. My apologies for the overlooking you there, Member Armijo Pruitt. Um, Mr. Sylvan, anything on the Public Safety Committee? Sure, Chair Olivas, um, board. Um, there's not been a Public Safety committee, in since, committee meeting since the last time we met. And 
I spoke in front of the board. But the next public safety committee meeting will be on Tuesday, June 15th at 3 p.m. And as within the past, I will send the board the agenda and a link to attend. Any questions from the board? Seeing none. Uh, thank you, Mr. Sylvan, for your reports. Appreciate it very much, as always. Uh, and we'll look forward to seeing that invite for the for the upcoming meeting on the 15th. From the uh, mayor's office, we have Pastor David Walker. Mr. Walker. Uh, you're on mute, sir. Thank you, Chair Levis and other board members. On behalf of uh, Mayor Kelly and the city of Albuquerque, uh, we uh, thank you again for giving us this opportunity to stand before uh, the Citizen uh, Oversight Committee to share with you some of the things that the Albuquerque, uh, City of Albuquerque and the Mayor's Office are doing. Uh, as you all are, are know, and I continue to be asked the question, what are we doing with the Gateway Project? And I want to share with you tonight to hoping to provide a sustainable solution that effectively address the issue of homelessness in the city of Albuquerque. The city continues to work with a network of existing community providers, networks and businesses to provide that shelter, uh, a safe shelter and services for the homeless population at the uh, Gibson Medical Center. We are continuing to work uh, and do the best that we can so that we can uh, help and provide shelter for those that are unfortunately living on the streets of Albuquerque. And we ask that you continue to support us in this, this effort. The city of Albuquerque continues to be supportive, not only uh, of, of every citizen and every organization uh, in the city of Albuquerque. This month is a very busy month for the city of Albuquerque. And uh, for example, uh, the city is celebrating uh, Immigrant Heritage Month. Uh, this month, where we, the uh, immigrant friendly city of Albuquerque, celebrate the uh, contributions of immigrants in the diversity of cultures in our uh, city. We also are in honor of Pride Month. The city is supporting the offices, uh, Office of Civil Rights, the New Mexico Black Lawyers Association, and the New Mexico LGBTQ Bar Association with hosting and supporting two events uh, aimed at increasing understanding and compassion regarding transgender people. The first event took place on June the 7th. The second event will take place on June the 17th uh, at 11.30 uh, a.m. We uh, invite you to visit the webpage and uh, uh, participate in these events and uh, be a part of what's taking place in the city. We also, in support of the Juneteenth celebration, the city of Albuquerque is supporting again and sponsoring a Juneteenth celebration, June the 18th through the 20th, held at Civic Plaza, Albuquerque, uh, to uh, help support the African American community as they celebrate uh, Juneteenth, the liberation of African Americans in the uh, uh, United States. Uh, again, uh, Mayor Keller, as you all may be aware, Mayor Keller signed onto a letter calling for a new deal of New Americans Act. He, along with uh, uh, a coalition of nearly 200 mayors from across the country, were hoping and seeking to enact the long overdue reforms to the immigration system. Uh, the mayor is committed, along with the other uh, mayors of uh, throughout the country to create a human and a modern immigration system that welcomes our immigrants, constituents, as well as allow them to be fully, more fully contribute to our communities. This new deal for New, Me new Americans Act seeks to fully integrate our immigrant residents into the fabric of our uh, cities and our counties by expanding access to immigration legal services and workforce. It also is to work to re reform our immigration system. Those are just a few of the things that's taken place throughout the city of Albuquerque this month, which has the support of the mayor, 
the mayor would like you to join in with him in these efforts to support every aspect of the city, all of the individuals that make up the city of Albuquerque. The mayor also would like you to know tonight, if you haven't heard already, that Mayor Kelly and other city leaders will be holding a telephone town hall to answer questions from, a, from people across Albuquerque who want to know more about the city's response uh, to the coronavirus, as well as we opening the city uh, facilities in our plans for recovery. Again, that uh, town hall, um, telephone town hall meeting will be taking place on June the 14th from 7.30 p.m. to 8.30 p.m. You can register again online at cab.q.gov uh, and uh, we would be more than glad for you to be a part of that as well. The mayor as well as he always does uh, throughout the city, the mayor has kicked off a summer meals program uh, to provide meals for the local kids all summer long and this will be held at six uh, different locations throughout the city of Albuquerque. Again, that information, if you are interested in any of the times and events, uh, places of any of these events, we encourage you to visit the city website and be a part of what's taking place in the city of Albuquerque. Thank you. I'll be ready for any questions if there is any. Thank you, Mr. Walker. Any questions from the board? Seeing none, I really appreciate your time tonight, uh, Pastor Walker, and uh, thank you for your report on what's happening around the city and in the mayor's office. Thank you. That concludes item D. Item E is the city attorney's office. I believe we have uh, with us from there, Lindsay Van Meter and Carlos Pacheco. Good evening, um, President Olivas and members of the board, I'm sorry, Chair Olivas and members of the board. Uh, I would first like to introduce Carlos Pacheco. He is coming in as the Senior Managing Assistant City Attorney for the City of Albuquerque. Um, he will be working on the CASA case and you'll probably be seeing a lot more of him as we move forward. Um, I have a few items to address with you. Oh, Carlos, would you like to introduce yourself? Hello, uh, thank you, Lindsay. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, I am Carlos Pacheco. I was formerly with the uh, district attorney's office, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm excited to work with you all, and uh, so please feel free to reach out. Uh, I'm still learning the ropes, so please bear with me, but uh, hopefully I'll be able to serve you all well with questions or concerns. Thanks. Today's Carlos's fourth day, so you know don't <laughs> don't overdo it right away for him. We're getting him uh, caught up. There's a lot to get kept caught up on. Um, I am continuing to work on the draft of the proposed MOU that will be um, submitted to the Civilian Police Oversight Agency Board, as well as the. Um, Albuquerque Police Officers Association, and hopefully that will help us resolve issues with regard to the videos um, and other materials that the board um, needs access to in order to perform its duties under the ordinance. Uh, I apologize that it's not done now. I've been trying to do more than one person's job, and now that Carlos is here, um, I'll have a little bit more time to work on that. Um, the city attorney, Mr. Aguilar, is continuing to work um, on ways to ensure that there will not be prolonged board vacancies as has happened in the past. Uh, we know that that's been put on hold for a little while, but uh, we will hopefully resume work on that in the near future. We will be um, meeting with you all as well as the DOJ um, and also looking to meet with other stakeholders if, if they seek input as well. The city is in discussions with the Department of Justice, as you likely heard during the hearing yesterday, regarding additional proposed methods to ensure that there are not prolonged board vacancies. Um, and then the final update, uh, oh, I'm sorry, there's one more. The, uh, on Monday, City Council approved the external force investigation team's uh, contract, and it is going through the process of being approved through, by the city. So um, that work will start most likely by the end of June. And um, at that point, we hope to have uh, 
beginnings of the processes to improve investigations by um, by the Internal Affairs Force Division. And then finally, yesterday we had our day long status conference with Judge Browning. Uh, presentations were given by the monitoring team, the Department of Justice, um, Albuquerque Police Department, the, the CAO of Albuquerque, City Legal, um, the APOA, and um, all six of the amici and stakeholders. Um, there was a lot to go over. Um, so I think I would just leave it at um, if there are specific questions. Um, if there's anything that we didn't have time to address in enough detail, I'm happy to answer any of the questions you have. Uh, members um, of the board? Oh, oh, sorry. Go ahead. I'm just looking to see if we have any questions here from the board. And, and just to let you know, as always, the Department of Justice um, will be obtaining the transcript of the hearing and circulating it um, so you all will have access to that as well. Great. Uh, one more opportunity for any questions from the board. Not seeing any apparent. So I appreciate we appreciate your report, Ms. Van Meter, and it's very nice to meet you, Mr. Pacheco. And, I'm uh, sure I speak for the whole board that we look forward to, to working with you and, and uh, spreading the workload a little more evenly here uh, to, to help Lindsay out. So we, we appreciate your arrival and wish you best of luck. Thank you. That concludes item E, city attorney. We'll go ahead and move on to item F, CPCs, uh, Mr. Mensa. Thank you, Chair Olivas. I was not here last month. Uh, we've had a lot of progress over the last month. The major thing that we've been doing is just getting uh, Ms. Martisa Billy uh, involved in the position. As you know, there's a lot of responsibilities and an awful lot to learn. She started one month ago today, so uh, it, it's been steady progress. She's doing an excellent job and uh, we are getting her along as to what she needs to know, who the players are, how they connect, CPOA, CPC, the different uh, Albuquerque agencies, uh, the police commanders, and et cetera. So uh, this has been my main focus for the last month, and I think it's going well. Other than that, uh, we did have the six Albuquerque town halls over the last uh, month that ended up at the end of May. And those were chaired by uh, Dr. Howard, uh, Harold Bailey and also uh, Pastor David Walker. They did a good job of making Albuquerque policemen look uh, and women look sympathetic to the public. And uh, we got some excellent questions, some very tough. And uh, I, I think that was a good event. We've been trying to use this event to do a little bit more recruiting and bring some new people in. As far as new recruiting, we have had uh, a couple of our uh, CPCs have had interviews. We have six members pending as to joining the council soon. Uh, we should have a notice about the vote this month. We've got one new member in the Northeast Council. We have interviewed three others, and uh, that's the next step toward being a pending member. So we've got 10 all together that are join, have joined or are looking to join soon. We are working on the MOU that's with, with a few of the other things that's taken uh, a, a bit of a on the back burner a bit because uh, we've had these these sort of things going on. But at the next council of chair meeting, I'm going to put their feet to the fire on getting that one started and hopefully done in a month or so. Uh, we did have a council of chairs in which we had a very important uh, vote re regarding membership of one member of the Southeast uh, CPC that was a bit contentious. I'm glad we got to go through the uh, voting process with this. I think we all grew as an organization because this is the first type of, uh, type of uh, the first time this sort of thing has happened that I'm aware of. And um, we're still sort of figuring out how that's gonna lie. We are now working on a welcome packet for new members. Uh, one of the issues has been as I said with Martisa earlier, there's so much information to learn as far as departments and acronyms and who's who and what the uh, CPC is and the history and who's involved. So uh, thanks to Martisa, we're working on a welcome packet now with 
probably 20 different sections with all of these. And what we will do is distribute this to every member. We'll make an online version with a lot of links and also a uh, paper version which we'll hand out. Uh, the recommendation process is big right now as well. Uh, we're all coming together from CPCs to uh, Sean Waite and, and a couple of other members of APD uh, to make it streamlined. It goes in here. This is where it goes next. It will be back on this in the, after this amount of time and uh, sort of like a production line. We want to get that where there's no uh, controversy because that's one of the issues right now. The CPCs feel that the recommendation process is a bit clouded and it, it changes too often. Um, let's see, we're also looking at starting some public meetings soon. We don't have a, a date for that set. I'm thinking maybe it's September. Uh, we've, we, we are thinking about getting some equipment, a PA system in, in order for community members who have a difficult time hearing. And uh, they want to do hybrid meetings down the line which are online as well as in person at the same time. I'm not sure that's, that's a great idea. I've voiced my opinion to Eric and uh, the other chairs on that one, but that's an ongoing discussion. But in any event, we should be ready to go back to in-person meeting soon. And uh, that's really about it right now. I will stand for questions. Any questions from the board? Not seeing any here. Uh, Kelly, we always appreciate your report. You you always have a lot going on. It seems like you got a lot of a lot of players there. And uh, you're you're speaking for myself, you're always impressive what you're what you're up to and, and what you get done. So all right. I'm ready to thank you. Joke, but thank you anyway. Thank you. We appreciate you. Uh, that concludes our CPC section, item F, and that takes us to our final report, uh, item G, CPOA, Director Harness. Chair Olivas Board, uh, I sent out my written copy of this report around noon today, so you should have it. Um, the board chair and the subcommittee chairs will be receiving monthly batch documents through DocuSign to serve, uh, to, to sign. Um, it, that's just a, a way for us to save a few dollars instead of uh, having to pay per envelope. If we send it out in batch, uh, it helps with cost savings. Uh, the city has changed the procurement process in the context of contract review. And I'm concerned that the proposed process is unworkable. Uh, Attorney Gooch and I will schedule a meeting with City Legal to discuss the proposed changes. Uh, number three, the CPOA will enter phase two of the city's new hiring process. Uh, the new process better defines the roles of the HR coordinator that is assigned to the CPOA and the CPOA hiring authority, which is myself. Um, it has the goal of shortening the hiring process to 60 days, as opposed to in the past, the hiring process would take an average of 116 days. IMR 14 data has been provided to Deputy Monitor Gia Quinto. The next IMR team visit will be June 21st through June 25th. That's in two weeks. It will be an in-person site visit, so those Appointments uh, will be scheduled, I'm imagining, next week. So pay attention to your calendar invites for meetings with the monitor and the associate monitor as they are in town. The traffic stop data request was submitted to APD and a receipt of that request has been noted by APD. The case materials for the level three use of force case 19-00 772.70 have been provided. Uh, that is the case that the board voted to review an OIS. Uh, you took that vote on the 8th of April. All materials for level three uses of force cases that have been reviewed by FRB through May 20th of this year have also now been provided. That link was sent to you yesterday. The office will be closed June 18th in commemoration of Juneteenth Day. 
And um, although I was firm on this when I wrote it, I'm not so firm on it now. Uh, next month board meeting will be conducted in city council chambers. Um, a directive came out from city that all, uh, as of June 14th, all boards and commissions are to meet in person again uh, with the proviso that we have to be able to accommodate uh, in a sort of a hybrid process. Um, there may be some glitches in that system according to uh, Ethan Watson, the city clerk. So we may meet in person July 8th and that's the best I can tell you at this point. Uh, other than that, I stand for questions. Questions from the board. I have a question for you and, and I realize you may not be able to answer it because I saw that memo, I think it was yesterday, uh, probably along with you on the, on the um, going back to in-person meetings, but I'm just curious what that, what that would look like to have a, a, an online option. Um, I'm just curious how that, how that works, if you have any insight on that. Chair Olivas, I'm not, uh, I'm not sure that an online option would be required because our meetings are already being broadcast on GovTV. Uh, so those are the kind of points that have to be clarified uh, when we move forward. Understood. Uh, any any further comments or questions from the board? Not seeing any. Thank you, Director Harness, and that concludes item G, and also concludes item uh, section six, reports from city departments. Section seven, uh, request for reconsideration. We have none tonight, so we'll go ahead and close that section out. Moving on to. Uh, section eight, review of cases. We have uh, item A, administratively closed cases. Uh, those cases listed are 031 21161-20287-20, Do we have a motion to? Uh, to review these cases or to, to accept the findings of these cases. I move that we accept the findings of the administratively closed cases. Second. We have a motion, we have a second. Uh, so that'll move us into the discussion section. Uh, first of all, Director Harness, can you confirm that we don't have any um, any individuals in the waiting room waiting to speak on these cases or, or any others? Uh, Chair Olivas, that's correct. We don't have anybody here to comment on any of the findings for any of the cases in item eight. However, for item C, uh, 029-21, uh, I did forward uh, comments from the complainant. Yes, and I did, I did review those. I just wanted to make sure we didn't have anyone uh, live here waiting uh, on these. So uh, with that said, we can continue on the discussion. Is there any discussion of these administratively closed cases? Seeing no hands here. Um, we have a motion, we have a second, no discussion. Ms. Barrella, could you please call the roll? Yes, member Armio Perret? Yes. Thank you, member Galloway? Yes. Member Johnson? Yes. Member Mitchell? Yes. Member Nixon? Yes. Member Olivas? Yes. Member Rell? Yes. That motion passed 7 0. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Barella. Uh, that takes us on to item B exonerated cases. Uh, there's only one case, 096 20. Do we have a motion to adopt the findings? I move that we accept the findings um, of case 096 20. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion on this case? Member Amy Hill Pruitt. So um, in watching the um, OBRD, I did have a couple of concerns. And I think that some of the things that the officer said set a tone with the folks that he was interacting there with there. Um, he said, and, and should I 
quickly like thumbnail sketch what this case was before I do this or is everybody on the same page? So it, this was a, a, an assault that happened in a hospital. Hospital staff called um, and when the officers arrived, one of the things that they said when they were reviewing the video footage that was collected by the hospital was that um, there, was, there had been an interaction between two people. One was a, a man sitting on the ground as, as um, the man, another man's child went by in a wheelchair, I guess. Um, the first man said something to the wheelchair bound person and then the, the third person jumped up, ran over and assaulted the man that was on the ground. Um, so the officer stated normal people don't have to put up with stuff like that. When he was talking about, he was referring to the person who did the assaulting as the normal person that doesn't have to put up with the things that was said by the other person. Um, the, the hospital staff was, was saying that this person didn't have um, decisional capacity, that he was not um, in a mental place to be able to do that. Um, the officer also then stated, when a guy's feelings are hurt, he acts like that. So I think um, this, was in re in, this was in response to the security guard I assume is a security guard. It's one of the folks in the room and they were watching the video who had stated that um, even if the officer had said that, that guy said some really ugly things some mean things to the person in the wheelchair and the other person who was off camera said, yeah, but that doesn't justify a physical attack. And this was the officer's statement back. So it felt to me like he was really setting a tone for excusing what on the video was a pretty um, a, a pretty bad assault. It looked like the man was on the ground. He, he kicked him. He punched him. Um, and when the when they so I think that there there was a I think that his response in that way to say that basically it was okay he basically gave permission for the behavior. He excused the behavior. Um, I realized that he, he finally, he did whatever he followed up and there was a, um, a criminal summons was given um, to the aggressor in that situation. But I do think it, it set the tone for the complaint because when he followed up afterwards and asked the guy if he, you looked like he had something else to say, I think there was a, a little bit of a, a, it felt a little bit challenging. And I think that's where, where the complaints came from. So I did feel like, like the officer, the way he decided to um, sort of evaluate the system made them feel like they weren't being taken seriously. And so that was in the, in the response in the um, findings letter, it was basically everything looked fine. Um, it seemed that the, it was noted by the investigator that the folks that worked for the hospital seemed like they didn't think that the cop was going to go ahead and take the next step and take it seriously. And it almost felt like there was a, a judgment about those folks not believing that he'd take it to the next step. So I just wanted to state that, like, I, I don't think that there's necessarily any reason not to um, approve these findings, but I did I don't know. I felt uncomfortable with the cop saying that normal people don't have to put up with this. Like cops and other people do have to put up with people talking to them in ugly ways, but normal people don't. And that when a guy's feelings are hurt, this is how he behaves. Like that piece about that's how people whose feelings are hurt behaves struck me as um, very dismissive to what the people's concerns were in the room. Thank you, Member Amy Hope Do we have any any other comments or discussion on that? Yeah, Member Nixon. Well, I, I definitely agree with uh, Member Amy Hope and what she's saying. You know, to be honest with you, I'm I'm not surprised that, that this officer is being exonerated and 
they didn't see anything wrong with it because I think that this is one of the biggest plagues and difficulties in dealing with with APD is the implicit bias and the latitude that officers have to kind of be unprofessional. I, I don't, I'm, I'm trying to understand at what point is it appropriate for him to make comments like that as opposed to just kind of doing the job as law enforcement there protecting and serving. And this is, this is what runs rampant. This kind of goes into that kind of implicit bias type thing where, you know, I don't know what it is, but that's something that we're, we're definitely going to have to address because as long as APD officers are allowed to do this and be exonerated for it and, or, or, you know, whatever's going to go on, we're still going to have problems with the public um, and their opinion of APD. So I just want to say that behind member Harvey Hope. Thank you. Any other comments or discussion? Not seeing any other board members hands up. One more look here. Uh, we'll go ahead and conclude the discussion here. Uh, this is again on case 096-20. Ms. Barella, could you please call the roll? Member Armio Pruitt? No. Member Galloway? Yes. Member Johnson? Yes. Member Mitchell? Yes. Member Nixon? No. Member Olivas? Yes. Member Rell? No. That motion passed uh, four to three, thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Barela. That takes us to item C. This has uh, two findings, one exonerated and not sustained, 029-21. Do we have a motion to accept the findings on this case? Motion to accept the findings of 029-21 as presented. Second. We have a motion and a, and, and a second. Do we have any discussion? And I would remind members we did have um, uh, a comment submitted by email on this, uh, on this case. Seeing no further discussion here, Ms. Borrello, would you please call the roll? Uh, yes. Member Armio Pruitt? Yes. Member Galloway? Yes. Member Johnson? Yes. Member Mitchell? Yes. Member Nixon? Yes. Member Olivas? Yes. Member Rell? Yes. Thank you. That motion passed seven zero. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Borrella. That takes us to our final uh, case tonight. We have item D, unfounded, 031-21. Do we have a motion to accept the findings in this case? Motion to accept the findings of 01321 as presented. And I'll second that. Uh, do we have any discussion on case 031-21, unfounded? Seeing no board members motioning to me here, uh, Ms. Borrella, could you please call the roll? Yes, Member Mio Pruitt? Yes. Member Galloway? Yes. Member Johnson? Yes. Thank you. Member Mitchell? Yes. Member Nixon? Yes. Member Olivas? Yes. Member Rell? Yes. That motion passed 7 0. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Barella. That concludes um, item eight review of cases. We'll go ahead and move on to item nine uh, serious use of force cases and officer involved shootings. Um, we have here six cases, each listed separately. And I would actually like to go ahead and make a motion to table these cases until the July meeting for review. Second. Uh, we have a motion and a second. Do we have any discussion here? What What is the reason to table? Uh, yeah, so I'll go ahead and uh, I guess I should have, have uh, led with a little, dis a little announcement on that. Um, this was at the request of member Dr. Cass, and I think that, that it was a well-informed request. We do have uh, two new members and a, an additional new member as well that's an observer. And uh, given the difficulties that we had accessing these cases, I know that for uh, I, I, Dr. Cass and I worked on several of these, having some trouble downloading the PowerPoints and that sort of thing. There is somewhat of a learning curve to, to getting into these cases and, and, and then being able to review them once you have access to the files themselves. 
And then I believe there is also uh, two, correct me if I'm wrong, Director Harness, there, there are, there's one case here that is a, a serious use of force case with um, uh, shooting. And those materials are, were only recently made available through a, a new link that APD provided. I believe that was just within the last uh, couple of days here that we got that link. And then we have another link for, uh, for the new case that just came in. Uh, Chair Levis, uh, that case that you're referring to, 18-0068735, uh, the link was resent. The original link was sent in April for with those materials. Uh, I did go into evidence.com and share those video files, and you should have received an invitation to look at those files, note that they were being shared, and if you were not registered with evidence, then you were being given a, an invitation to register to gain access to those videos. Um, that was recent after our meeting with IAFD last week to ensure that that system was working. So that link was resent last week uh, for those videos. Yes, and, and that's correct. And, and um, I, was, I, I was able to access that along with the other cases, able to access the, um, the PowerPoints and the videos within those PowerPoints if you download them. But I think that the intent here was just to make sure that everyone had uh, the time to access these links and videos um, and, and then be able to review them. So uh, the process going forward, according to the process that the board has adopted as well, will be that uh, each agenda will feature essentially two, series, two sections under, uh, two, two areas under this section, let's call it. Uh, one will be the cases that we'll be reviewing that month. And the other section will be the cases that are uh, essentially teed up for the next month because um, another concern that, that Dr. Cast had is that these cases do take a significant amount of time to, to review, to watch the video um, and compile thoughts on. And this allows, um, allows a full month for review rather than uh, if you're waiting for the agenda to come out, you may only have uh, less than a week to review those cases and, and put together your findings. So I think that's the, the thinking behind this. I do see a, a hand here from uh, Mr. Johnson, Member Johnson. Yes, thank you. I wanted to say, uh, Chair Olivas, um, thank you for make for tabling this and, and bringing that up because you're right. Um, tomorrow I'm supposed to go pick up my tablet. I'm gonna download everything in. And there is a learning curve. I sat with Dr. Cass, he came by um, my house and he explained some things to me and there's a curve there in learning how to not only download the files, but also learn how to read the paperwork. Um, if it's your first time and it is, it's mine, then you know it's gonna take a little while for you to thumb through it and to uh, look at it to where you can gather your thoughts um, fairly and justly. So I wanted to say thank you uh, for tabling this and putting this motion. I don't know if I'm <laughs> using the correct, uh, <laughs> the correct uh, words, but for putting this in effect to where we, it'll give us a little bit more time to kind of uh, catch up. Thank you. Thank you, member Johnson. And uh, I, I, would, I would add though, I do have my concerns about this given that we, we, uh, we only grow the backlog here as we, as we kick this can down the road. Um, however, I, I realized this problem was only solved uh, in full about a week ago. So uh, member Armijo Pruitt. I am still having issues with getting um, PowerPoints and a couple of uh, other things to download from those uh, links. And I'm not sure if it's something with my computer and be able in large part to get access, but then I'll hit a snag and there'll be a PowerPoint or an investigative file that I can't access. Yeah, and, and just feel free to reach out to me or uh, Dr. Cass or one of the other members or Director Harness and, and we can hopefully all work together to, to work through those hiccups so that we can make this process work. And, um, you know, I would say, I guess the, the downside of this is it does likely mean that we'll be reviewing more cases uh, as we go forward, the caseload will grow. So we'll need to 
uh, review additional cases to, to try to catch up. But I think that's uh, the trade-off we're making here. Any further comments? All right, we have a motion and a second. That concludes the discussion. Ms. Barilla, could you call the roll on the motion to table these items uh, for the July meeting? Member Armio Pruitt? Yes. Member Galloway? Yes. Member Johnson? Yes. Member Mitchell? A reluctant yes. Member Nixon? Yes. Member Olivas? Yes. Member Rell? Yes. Thank you. That motion passed 7 0. Thank you, Ms. Barella. And uh, so I would just encourage members, new and existing, to um, start working on these cases sooner rather than later. So if you do have technical issues or questions on the materials, uh, you have plenty of time to, to reach out and get assistance so that we don't run into this snag again uh, going forward. So, And then going forward, we'll expect to have two, essentially two sections here where the board will tee up the cases for the next month and then review the cases for the uh, current month. That concludes uh, item nine. And uh, I'm, if it please the board here, I'm thinking maybe we can take reports from subcommittees and then uh, take a, a brief recess and return for, for our discussion section. Not seeing any major uh, outcries to that. So we'll go ahead and move on to item uh, section nine, reports from subcommittees. Our first subcommittee is uh, community outreach, Vice Chair Galloway. Thank you, Chair Olivas. Um, I submitted my report to the board and I don't really have anything to add other than I am kind of toying with restructuring the way that trainings are presented in the policies and procedures. I have an email out to Director Harness asking um, for his insight on that. Carol Levis has reviewed it and thinks that it looks good, but I think I may be able to tailor it just a bit more um, for the board's consideration next month. So just so you know, that's on the horizon. Any questions for Vice Chair Galloway? Thank you, Vice Chair Galloway. Uh, item B, we have the Policy and Procedure Review Subcommittee. Uh, Dr. Cass is not with us tonight. Um, I was not at this meeting. I do sit on the subcommittee. Do we have a member of the subcommittee that uh, would like to give a report? Or we also have uh, a written report that does include the, um, the pertinent material. Member Amy I think that um, Dr. Cass's write-up that he sent, the report he sent out um, is very detailed. I don't think there's anything to add in the meeting. All right, thank you, Member Armijo Pruitt. Uh, and the next meeting of that subcommittee is uh, July 1st at 4.30 p.m. Case review subcommittee. Um, Member Nixon, it looks like you didn't meet, but I don't know if you had anything you wanted to report. I don't have anything to report other than we have um, postponed the meetings, um, I think until further notice. I know that we were supposed to be talking about the case review committee and whether or not it was going to continue, but I was asked to postpone it. Unless I misconstrued something, so I don't have anything to report. Thanks. Thank you, Member Nixon. Um, and then item D here, personnel subcommittee. Uh, recognize myself for this item. We met on June 1st at 4 p.m. I did submit my written report and I don't believe I have anything uh, additional to add here. We do tentatively have our next meeting scheduled for uh, June 28th at 4 p.m. Although um, as the committee has discussed in the past, if we don't have a need for a meeting, we will not meet. And uh, my anticipation as of now is that we may not need the meeting on the 28th, but uh, we will stand by and, um, and I'll, I'll let you know as soon as possible. Stand for any questions. Seeing none, that concludes uh, section nine, reports from subcommittees. And if we could take a, uh, let's say a 15 minute recess, we can reconvene at 6.50. Does that work for everyone? All right, uh, recess.
Uh, this is a meeting of the City of Albuquerque Civilian Police Oversight Agency Board. This is Chair Oliva speaking. We are reconvening from a 15 minute recess. The time now is 6.51 and we will go ahead and resume our meeting with item number, this is item number 10, discussion and possible action. Uh, the first item, item A, we have the uh, IMR liaison um, proposal is how this is titled. This should actually be IMR liaison appointment. I believe the board adopted the proposal to appoint a liaison at the May 20th meeting. Um, I defer to our legal counsel if we need to um, change that or defer this due to that error or um, Chair Olivas, I, I believe you're fine given the information provided in your agenda versus the motion that is going to be presented to the board tonight. All right. Thank you for your guidance there, uh, Attorney Gooch. So we'll go ahead and uh, move with this proposal. Uh, I would like to make a motion to appoint member Tara Armijo Pruitt, the IMR liaison pursuant to the board policies and procedures that were changed at our previous meeting. Second. We have a motion and a second. Uh, member Armijo Pruitt's not here yet, but um, there was some indication in, in committee that she would be willing to do this if uh, if so asked. So um, I'll, I'll assume that that offer still stands. Do we have any discussion on this? Seeing none, uh, Ms. Barilla, could you please call the roll? Uh, yes, but I do have a question. Is Ms. Armijo Pruitt excused from voting? Um, Member Armijo Pruitt, are you there? I was assuming that she would be back with us before we uh, begun here. I think it's Officer of Gooch. members present. Is that right, Tina? Yeah, Chair Levis, Member Galloway, um, and Ms. Barella. It says those who are in the room. I would say that the Zoom room constitutes a room and therefore she would be excused from this vote. Um, and we should make a record noting that she isn't back yet. And when she does come back, note that for the record as well. Thank okay. you. And uh, just for the record, is uh, Member Ralph back? Yes, I believe her camera was on a minute ago. And yeah, I I'm here. Okay. Wanted to make sure to ask members for some some assistance there. If you're if you're with us, if you could please just leave your camera on, um, just so that we can you know for the record we can know that that uh, folks are there or not there, and that'll help us move through these a little more quickly. And um, also, I wanted to, to well, we'll go ahead and move move through with this, and then I'll I'll say the next thing. Okay. So if we could go ahead and call the roll on that, knowing that uh, noting that member Armijo Pruitt is. Uh, currently not in the room and, and is excused from this vote. Okay, thank you. Member Galloway? Yes. Member Johnson? Yes. Member Mitchell? Yes. Member Nixon? Yes. Member Olivas? Yes. Member Ralph? Yes. The motion passed 6-0 uh, with member Amiral Pruitt uh, not back to the meeting. Thank you, Ms. Barella. Um, and I was also gonna uh, refresh here since we do have some new members and, and uh, I actually didn't follow my standard protocol on that, but uh, now that we're in the discussion and possible action section, uh, the typical way that, we're, that I like to run the discussion section and the board has, has generally um, seemed to well receive it uh, is we will have a rotating order of discussion rather than a, um, uh, a call for discussion. So in the earlier items, we'll, we'll just ask for, for hands. In this section, we'll, we'll actually go through a rotation. If you don't have anything to say, you can just indicate that, that you pass or um, you have nothing to say. Uh, item B, IMR 13 and the June 9th uh, hearing yesterday. On this item, we have uh, Attorney Gooch and Director Harness. I'll let the two of you decide how you want to uh, split that up. Um, Chair Levis, Director Harness, I'm happy to proceed if you'd like, or I would defer to you since you spoke at the hearing. Thank you, Director Harness. Um, I, I provided you all with a summary that was not as 
summarial as I would have liked, but it should have provided you a lot of information to know at least when the transcript comes out, the timestamps to look for further details should you be interested in looking for that information. And as um, is tradition with the Department of Justice, when that transcript is finalized and submitted to the court, it will be presented to you all as well as the public and anyone else um, that has asked or would like to see it. Um, overall, it, it, was a, it was a public hearing in which no action was meant or did occur. Um, the court is very amenable to allowing the parties to come before him with any pro problems, concerns, and believe that the board has its problems and concerns with the air of the city and Department of Justice at this point. We're hoping to keep those moving in a positive direction and remind all of you that Department of Justice at the hearing and has continually reiterated if there's an issue or something that the stakeholders or the community thinks warrants further concern or to be addressed to please let them know. Um, I, I stand for questions or I defer to Director Harness if there's anything else to add. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Attorney Gooch, Chair uh, Olivas and board. Um, no, I think there were some, some good discussions. There were uh, some very pointed questions from Judge Browning regarding the parties, uh, confidence in the work of the monitoring team and whether or not they uh, should be removed. Uh, there was contemplation of the APOA being held in contempt, uh, which none of the parties uh, were uh, in favor of uh, doing so based upon their uh, campaign for crime versus the CASA. Uh, the president of the APOA, Mr. Willoughby, or Detective Willoughby, gave a very animated uh, presentation, which uh, was helpful in the late to mid-noon time, given the, the length of the hearing and what, what had taken place. Um, and I would, just add, I would just end with, I think it would have been appropriate for the board to ask uh, the city, represent, city representatives what their plans were uh, at this meeting, at this meeting, ask the city what their plans were for uh, remedying the situations uh, as described in IMR 13. Do we have any, uh, any discussion or questions, comments on this? And uh, I'll go ahead and turn it over. Uh, well, and I, I wanna note here initially that uh, member Armijo Pruitt has rejoined the meeting and I'm not sure if you were uh, with us there, member Emil Pruitt, but we were receiving a report on uh, IMR 13 in the public hearing yesterday. And I hate to throw you into the, the ringer here, but through our order of discussion, you're, you're up first. So if you have any questions or comments or um, anything on that. I don't, thank you. I was able to, to watch most of, most of the hearing throughout the day and I appreciated the, the notes on it. Um, I did miss a bit of what was given just now, but I feel pretty pretty well informed on it. Thank you. Thank you, Member Armijo Pruitt. Second in the order, uh, Member Galloway. Yeah, I have a, a couple of things. As I was listening to the, um, the dialogue between the city attorneys and whether or not there was a lot of discussion, not only with the APOA's uh, campaign, Crime Matters More campaign, but there was a lot of discussion, it seemed like, about whether or not the APOA should be a party to the settlement agreement. Um, and it, I oftentimes feel as though the APOA and the CPOA are two sides of the same coin. And I, I know we've talked in the past, um, about considering intervener status and going down that road when there were critical incidents that were going on. Um, and I just kind of wonder if, the end goal being that we no longer have an independent monitoring team and we're out from the settlement agreement, whether or not this body should advocate for more of a role in this process and more of a voice rather than simply relying on um, our friends at DOJ or part of the amici groups to speak on our behalf, although they have always been faithful to represent us and represent us accurately. Um, I do kind of wonder if we shouldn't be considering our own position 
um, within this process and advocating a little bit more for a stronger voice. The other thing that I, I just wanted to um, ask Director Harness for some clarity on uh, both Dan G. Quinto and Ms. Martinez referenced a caseload for investigators of 80 to 100. Um, I think Dan's was slightly more than 100. And I just wanna know where, where those numbers come from, how that's determined. Chair Olivas, uh, Vice Chair Galloway, that's the number of cases assigned to investigators O'Neill and McDermott at this point. What about investigator um, Coca? His caseload is less because he's a newer investigator and it's just uh, come off of probation. Okay, thank you. That's all I have, Chair Olivas. Thank you, member Galloway. Uh, next in the order of discussion, member Johnson. Um, I don't have anything to say at this time, thank you. Member Mitchell. I have nothing to offer, thank you. Member Nixon. Nothing, thanks. I'll recognize myself. Um, I, did, I did get a chance to watch nearly all of the hearing. Um, the only part I missed actually was the very end when the uh, CPOA was recognized. Um, but my understanding just based on the very limited amount of time that was left at the end uh, is that it was a, uh, a short and sweet uh, presentation, which I think builds on the concern of member Galloway, given that, you know, I, I think she raises a good, Vice Chair Galloway, excuse me, uh, raises a good point here that um, for the future monitor, if you will, that's, that is in an ideal world, that's the board here before us or, or some iteration of it. Uh, for the future monitor to, and, and the agency itself, to only have um, five minutes or less of time before the court and uh, time before the public to really advocate for its needs and issues uh, does raise a concern when, you know, the union was given a, a significant amount of time, um, as were the other parties, as, as they should be. But I think that, that it raises, uh, it does raise the question, of course, um, there's only so many hours in the day and I'm sure that every party to the case would, particularly the more, uh, the, the, the parties we're, we're in the same boat with MRAC and, and uh, CPCs and other groups are, are gonna advocate for the same thing. But I think that um, it does raise a good question about whether we are uh, given the, the status that should be afforded to the the future of this process and and uh, and what's going on with that. So, I also think it's uh, important to highlight that um, many good things were said about CPOA and particularly our our current investigative staff and their ability to handle cases and complete cases um, within not all cases within timelines, but seventy percent of of cases being completed within timelines despite the uh, significant workload before them. I think that's. Uh, that's high praise from uh, from the folks that, that look at this, and um, I think that's that's worth noting here and congratulating the staff and the director on, on the good work there. Member Ruff, I have nothing at this time. Thank you. And uh, Director Harness or Attorney Gooch, do you have anything else to add before we close this item out? Uh, Chair Olivas, uh, thank you for recognizing that uh, the parties did recognize the work of the agency, uh, especially in the context of what uh, Commander Cottrell has presented today, that uh, they want their, their investigative staff to have a caseload of about 11. Uh, and the presentations to the court that showed that the force division investigators were working on one case at a time. Uh, and when you contrast the work of IAPS and IAFD and the work that is produced by our agency, noting that we have not had any discipline not imposed because of investigation time bar and as I pointed out, we opened up 331 cases in the year 2020. And that was with 
three, partially four investigators, and at one point in time, two investigators along with COVID for the year 2020. So hats off to our staff and the, the work that they do uh, on a daily basis. Thanks. Absolutely. And, and actually, one other thing you reminded me of there that, that you didn't state, um, it was also noted that your, your staff and your agency does a, a very good job of triaging cases to identify those cases where uh, potential discipline is, is likely or possible um, and moving those cases to the front of the line so that, uh, so that those are completed within timelines. Um, there was uh, some significant praise levied on that. And I think that's a, another important strength of the CPOA. So thank you both for, for your report and your representation of the, of the board and the agency in the, uh, in the meeting. That concludes item C, uh, item B, I'm sorry. Item C, we have an update on serious use of force cases and officer involved shooting case materials. Um, on this item, we also have Councillor Gooch and Director Harness. Uh, Charlie, this honorable board, I, I have an update that is there is no update yet. Uh, as Ms. Van Meter presented um, during her report, the city has not yet circulated the draft memorandum of understanding that would help hopefully streamline getting you all the redacted OBRD footage that's associated with these serious use of force cases. I will defer director to Director Harness about the other logistical issues in accessing the FRB PowerPoints and the links and videos and that, because um, I don't have access to know how that is going, but it sounds like it might be a positive report from the director. Yes, thanks Attorney Gooch, Chair Levis and board. Uh, as I stated in my uh, report, uh, you now have the FRB materials or PowerPoint presentations and minutes through May 20th of 2021. That link was provided to you, uh, I believe yesterday. Um, and then there's also that officer involved shooting case that you voted to review in, back in April that those materials have been provided as well. Uh, Dr. Cass and I had a meeting with uh, IAFD to work out the kinks in gaining access. I believe that we have them all worked out. Um, I have not gone into evidence.com to share the videos for the OIS. I will do that tomorrow uh, because I just didn't want to inundate you with all of this stuff prior to a meeting um, when it's not on your agenda to review anyway. But I will go in and share those videos for that particular case and I'll perform that function tomorrow. So you should look for those. And then you will have, I did not go into that link as yet for the cases through May 20th, but uh, I'm doing one or two reviews of level three cases every week for force review board. So um, I'm sure there's adequate case material there for you uh, to keep you busy. Oh, and um, note that uh, in order to view the PowerPoint, you have to download the PowerPoints for it to work uh, uh, without it being so clunky and slow. And to be able to view the video, you have to actually download the PowerPoint presentation. And uh, that's a little icon on the very top right of the screen when you go into that share base program. And of course, if you're having any issues, uh, please, please let us know right away so we can help work you through those. Thank you, Director Harness and Councillor Gooch. Um, and I, I will go ahead and open this up to discussion because I think it, it's useful if there are any questions from new members or existing members on the process or, or where we're at with this, uh, this is a good chance for us to, to work those things out. So uh, in this discussion, item member Galloway, you're up first. Vice Chair Galloway, sorry, I keep messing that up. That's fine, um, nothing for me, thank you. Uh, Member Johnson. Uh, nothing for me as well. Member Mitchell. Nothing at this time. Member Nixon. Nothing, thank you. Um, and for myself, again, I just uh, recognize myself here. Um, I just urge everyone to, to take a look at those. If you haven't, familiar, familiarize yourself with the process 
and uh, be prepared for the caseload to increase as time goes on. So Dr. Cass, as the uh, appointed manager of, of serious use of force cases, uh, will be presenting a new batch of cases at the July meeting for review in August. And presumably there may also be at that time a vote on requesting materials if, if uh, he deems that there would be materials that are needed. Again, at any time, any member can ask for those materials on any case. I, I shouldn't say they can ask, they can ask the board to request those materials. So if you're reviewing a case and you find that uh, something is concerning or you don't feel that there's enough information in the FRB report, uh, you can come to the board and make a motion to request whatever data or footage you think is, is uh, needed or to request the full case file. So keep that in mind as you review cases. And then, you know, it's, it's typically been the practice of the board up to this point that for cases involving uh, shootings that we do request those materials. And, and that does take a significant amount of time and resources for APD to redact those and make them available. But I think that we're, we're getting to the point here where this, this should start taking off soon. Uh, Member Ralph. I have no comment. And Member Amiho Pruitt. No comment, thank you. All right, we will go ahead and close out item C on serious use of force cases. Item D is uh, an update on board vacancies and city council appointments. Uh, Director Harness. Uh, Chair Levis, much like um, item C, uh, there really is not much of an update at this point. Uh, we did receive a, an email update from uh, City Attorney Aguilar this afternoon that there, it is still on their radar and that they're working on uh, setting up another meeting to discuss uh, a system so that there is not uh, the delay in appointment. Um, and I also believe that this is still on the Department of Justice's radar as they are contemplating several stipulated orders to be presented to the court. And I believe this issue would be one of them. Thank you, Director Harness. Um, and I also uh, wanna go ahead and leave the discussion on here because I think for, uh, especially for our newer members, uh, there may be important commentary you may have on, on this process since you recently went through it. And if not, um, you're certainly welcome to pass. Uh, Member Johnson, you're up first here. I have nothing. Thank you. Member Mitchell. Um, nothing. Member Nixon? Uh, nothing, thank you. Um, for myself, I would just reiterate what, what Director Harness said. I think it's important we stay on this issue given that uh, we, you know, we're, we're about to have a fully staffed board, but in the past that has changed quickly. And uh, I think that the underlying systemic issues that caused the high turnover on the board have not been addressed in any serious way. So, um, I think it remains an issue of concern that the board needs to uh, to focus on going forward. Member Ralph? I have no comment, thank you. Member Amiho Pruitt? Um, I did have one, one question. And one of the things like you referencing the high turnover of the board, and I'm wondering about, I know, I don't know what's, if we've done a, a real um, in-depth look at what, what that's about, uh, but one of the things I know we have discussed was the onboarding process. Um, and I was wondering, I know that um, Mr. Mensa tonight had said he was putting together a packet for the CPC um, onboardees. Um, and I'm wondering if it, there's a lot of overlap with that information in terms of like getting to know the different players and that sort of stuff. And it might be a good recommendation that we use that as well um, for just getting new board members um, oriented to who the players are and what the what the different things um, what the different uh, entities are responsible for and that sort of thing. Thank you, Member Amhi Pruitt, Member Galloway. 
just to kind of circle back a little bit to member Armijo Pruitt's um, point, we do have electronically the onboarding packet type of material. It used to come in the form of a binder. And um, I think that we've decided to do away with that and now do thumb drives or have it on the shared drive. So I think we do have that. I had the same thought about not reinventing the wheel for Kelly when he was giving that report, because you're right, there are some really good um, materials that we've already kind of pulled together that would overlap nicely with the CPCs. But I don't think that we have anything that talks about who, like, like a, we have an acronym list, but I don't think we have anything that talks about who the players are. And I think that's a really good point um, and something that we should probably kick over to outreach to get that done. Um, we also are, I think member Nixon was tasked the, the job of kind of developing an exit survey and maybe interviewing some of the more recently um, departed board members for their reasonings behind why they left because it's often communicated um, that the reason people leave is the workload. And I, I just disagree 100%. I think that um, we can very easily point to the departures of the people who have left most recently. And no, I mean, know why they left, right? We lost member um, Van Deventer because of her job. We lost member Fine because her time was up. <laughs> I mean, we know why they left. Uh, member Starr left for medical reasons. She just stopped coming. It wasn't a workload thing. She just stopped. So I, I, I disagree every time and I kind of get my heckles up whenever I hear it's because of workload. I think that that's a challenge for board members, but I don't think that's the reason they leave. So we're kind of going through that with the outreach committee to determine Thank you, Vice Chair Galloway. Uh, any other discussion or comment on this this issue? So, um, you know, certainly we can we can follow up on this again at, at uh, future meetings, and and um, I know that's always on the the mind of outreach as far as making sure that we do good good outreach to our our new members, the new board members, and and get them up to speed as much as we can. So, uh, I'll leave that with outreach to to bring back to us any proposals or anything like that. And, uh, and certainly if we have any future updates on uh, this working group with, uh, with city council appointments, I believe there was only one meeting of that work group that's occurred so far. Uh, Dr. Cass was the representative of the board in that meeting. And uh, I do intend to participate in that if uh, we get another meeting scheduled, which was uh, contemplated after the hearing yesterday had passed since uh, folks would presumably have more time at that point. So look forward to seeing that and continuing to work on this issue. That concludes item D. We'll move on to item E, uh, APOA letter approval member Galloway, this uh, vice chair Galloway, this is your item. I'm gonna keep doing that all night. And I'm gonna be fine with it all night, it's totally fine. Um, so the letter was drafted and presented to the outreach committee and approved by the outreach committee. It's short and sweet to the point. Um, and so now I would make a motion that we accept this letter and authorize Chair Olivas to send it off to uh, Detective Willoughby. Second. Uh, if I could just ask you to, to clarify one thing, if, if we could authorize myself and, and uh, administrative staff to, to help with that? Yes, uh, absolutely. So we have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion of this item? And this one, I'll, I'll go ahead and pass the, the normal order since I don't think that there's gonna be a lot of discussion here. Uh, Ms. Borrella, could you please call the roll? Member Emil Pritt? Yes. Thank you. Member Galloway? Yes. Member Johnson? Yes. Member Mitchell? Yes. Member Nixon? Yes. Member Olivas? Yes. Member Rell? Yes. Thank you. That motion passed 7 0. Thank you. We'll work uh, with, I'll, I'll work with the board staff to, uh, to finalize that letter and get that sent off to APOA to, to make sure they know that we're always available to work with them and uh, get that sent off. 
Item E uh, is my item and, and also Attorney Gooch, board member responsibilities. So um, I'll go ahead and, and kick this over to Attorney Gooch when it gets to her, her portions here. Uh, basically, these are just a few reminders here for our existing members and uh, new members as well. Since you may not be uh, completely familiar with all these protocols or know how these things apply to, to certain situations, um, outside meeting attendance, so we're often invited to participate in, for example, yesterday, the um, IMR public hearing or uh, city council public safety committee, um, Miki sessions, things like that, different public meetings of that sort. If you are planning on attending one of those meetings, uh, please, as a courtesy, let Director Harness and or admin staff know that you're planning on attending. I know that sometimes, you know, things free up at the last minute and, and you know, you don't know until the day of, but if you know you're gonna go to a meeting ahead of time, please let them know. And the reason being for this is uh, it has to do with uh, OMA requirements. If a quorum of the board may be present at the meeting, we do need to post a notice of quorum in order to stay um, right with the OMA. So if you are planning on attending an outside meeting, just let a member of staff know so that uh, they can prepare for that. And if they anticipate that there's a need for a notice, they'll get one posted so that we stay right with that. Uh, number two in this section is subcommittee meeting, meeting attendance. It's a very similar issue that we're not necessarily seeing, but, but could see in subcommittee meetings. Um, we let everyone know when subcommittees are happening and uh, at times those Zoom in invites uh, do go out to the whole board, not all the time, but sometimes they do. Um, and certainly you are uh, able to attend those subcommittee meetings, but if you don't sit on a subcommittee and you want to attend, uh, you first of all, you obviously won't be a voting member of the subcommittee, though votes typically are not binding or anything of that. So it, in subcommittees, um, you would need to let staff and, and the chair of the subcommittee know again, so that they can post a notice of quorum given that uh, a fully staffed subcommittee is one member short of a quorum of the board. So we need to make sure that we uh, avoid those kinds of issues. So if you, if you are attending something where you're either not a member of the committee or it's an outside meeting, just uh, do that as a, uh, as a courtesy to, to the board and to the staff. Number three here, I'll go ahead and turn this over to Council Gooch, but there, there have been repeated questions about uh, abstentions and recusals and voting and when this is appropriate. And I'll, I'll let Council Gooch uh, just give us a, a gentle reminder of, of how that works. Thank you, Chair Levis, Honorable Board. Your policies and procedures provide that, and as we learned tonight, you have to be in the room, but that any action on a question is lost by a tie vote and every board member who is within the room shall vote upon each question, except those who have disqualified themselves due to a conflict of interest. So whether you were at the last meeting and are asked to approve minutes, whether you've had a chance to look at a particular case or not, absent a conflict, if you are at the meeting, and in this case in the Zoom meeting, you must vote yes or no. Now, if it poses a problem or concern, you may seek from the rest of the board a, a suspension of your rules to allow you to not have to vote, like we did a couple last meeting for our newest board members that were authorized to participate, but yet didn't have access to the case materials. So that is, that's what your policies provide, but it, it is, you know, able to be updated based on a vote of a two thirds majority if there's a situation where it becomes a problem. Um, I don't know why that is in your policies and procedures that has been there since long before I was your counsel, but I think it makes sense to create an opportunity for everyone to have their voice heard. Um, and also because of the ability to abstain or suspend the rules, it, it provides a good equilibrium so that the board can function. Um, if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Any questions for Attorney Gooch? And I, I would just uh, also, oh, uh, Member Gall uh, Vice Chair Galloway. I'm just wondering if it would be um, acceptable to the board as I'm going through and kind of working through our policies and procedures, if I clean up that language a little bit and allow for the opportunity um, 
for example, Member Mitchell missed a meeting and didn't feel comfortable voting on the minutes and approving the minutes because he wasn't part of that meeting, allow for those type of opportunities. Is that something that we can do? Still giving members the ability to, if they want to vote on those things, but giving them the out. Um, sorry, Chair, Chair Levis, Vice Chair Galloway. I don't recommend that you make it so um, gray, if you will. I think that you need to have a black and white rule that allows for a suspension of the rules if and when it becomes warranted. With regard to minutes, for instance, I believe that you all get those and can review them whether or not you were at the meeting. And I'm not by any means saying that that's something that I expect of the board. But I just, I worry that the exceptions might swallow the rule if you go down that path. Fair enough. Thank you for that, Council. Any other comments or discussion? Uh, Member Mitchell. Um, Tina, would you feel more comfortable if the, if the focus was narrowed to say uh, specifically allow uh, abstaining for meeting minutes in which you were not a participant? Um, Chair Galloway, uh, Chair, Chair Olivas, I'm sorry, now I'm gonna mess up the names tonight. Member Mitchell, yeah, I think, I think that if the board is interested in exploring a very limited but very precise ability to allow an abstention, that that's something that would be implement um, and more fair to implement, but the other thing that members can do, for instance, with Dr. Cass missing tonight's meeting, he could ask at the start of next month's meeting to suspend the rules to allow him to not have to vote on the minutes if he had a chance to view them or if that's a concern to him. Um, but I defer to the board. If you all think you want to do that, um, I can review it for you. Member Rao. Yes, I would like to see that um looked at definitely because um, the rule was thrown at me in my very first meeting um, and I had to vote and help me God, I hope I voted the right way. Um, and I, I, I just think that we should have some type of stipulation or something in there if it's a, a, a new member, you know, just like any other place, give me 30 days, you know, to kind of learn the ropes or understand what I'm even voting on. I mean, I, I, I didn't just vote on um, the different um, uh, items that were on the agenda, but I also had to vote uh, uh, if there, if I had any discussion and each time really I said, no, I was someone to say, what are you guys talking about? You know, so I do think there should be some type of, uh, area for new members coming on. Um, the cases are given to us, bam, here's all the cases. Here's the agenda. Here it is now vote. And so, uh, just a little bit, you know, help us out a little bit. I remember new group. So when it comes to minutes, I mean, I have voted no because I hadn't had a chance to review the the video of the meeting or whatever. I think if it's for absences, I mean, a no is not going to scuttle a whole vote on approving minutes unless a bunch of people weren't there, in which case, how are you, you know, I don't know. So uh, also, I just for anyone's reference, I try and watch the watch the GovTV, the YouTube video of the meetings I miss, and it makes me feel more comfortable with voting on the minutes. But if I don't have a chance to do that, I just vote no. Other board members? Uh, on, on my end, oh, Member Nixon. Um, just real quick, um, sounds like uh, there may be a need for a new member orientation packet, meeting, whatever it is, but a process for new new member orientation. That's it. Thank you, Member Nixon. Um, on my end, I, I would say I do not support really any changes to this provision because I think from the standpoint of running the meeting, um, you run the risk of coming to a point where, you know, one, okay, maybe two members uh, abstain because they're new or three members abstain because they're, they're new and then two members were absent. Uh, so they abstain or they vote no, uh, well, they abstain. And so then you have, you know, maybe two or three people on the board um, 
because let's say there's other people absent at that meeting, um, as there often are, especially as the board grows, it's, it's more likely that one or two people will be absent. Um, you may run into a situation where you only have two or three people voting on issues. And uh, like for, for instance, the minutes, I think member Emil Pruitt makes a good point. You can always vote no. Um, and your, your vote in favor of the minutes does not necessarily imply that um, you were at the meeting. It implies that you approve the minutes themselves. So we're also talking about grammatical edits and, and those kinds of things that you, you can do regardless of whether you were at the meeting or not. Um, on other issues, I, I do understand that for new members, it's it's complicated to to throw you into the ringer and you know give you this this huge caseload as you're just trying to get up to speed. Um, so you know maybe there there needs to be that. And, and again, that suspension of the rules is I think the the a good solution for that rather than writing in a bunch of outs to this that then create sort of a, a Swiss cheese here where there's all kinds of holes and, and you end up in situations where only one or two people are voting on a, on a given issue because of absences and abstentions and such. So that's my piece on that. Do we have any other comments or, or questions here? I, I apologize for not proceeding with the usual order. I didn't expect a lot of discussion on that, but that, that's good. I think that's healthy that we talk about that. And, and certainly if anybody wants to pursue that further, I think you're, you're free to, you know, examine those policies and procedures and offer a motion for, for what you'd like to do. Uh, I, I would, you know, suggest you run that through a committee first, but I think most of our committees would be happy to take a look at that and, uh, and bring it to the board if, if it can, uh, if it can move through there. So, excuse me. I, um, this is item F number four, training requirements. Uh, I believe based on the reports that I've gotten from Director Harness, uh, we do have uh, all of our, um, I guess I would call them veteran members uh, that, are, that are current with their training. Is that correct, Director Harness? Uh, Chair Olivas, no, that would not be correct. Um, I've provided the... Uh, checklist to all the members. Uh, Member Mitchell has uh, been very vigilant about uh, going through the training. Um, but other than that, I would not categorize the veterans as being um, up to speed or having completed all of the training. Okay, so I, I'm sorry. I thought I saw a couple of emails come through where there was confirmation that those those videos and trainings and PowerPoints and such had been uh, watched. Uh, I'll go back and, and review that. But um, then this becomes a, a uh, again, a reminder that we need to get those completed. If you have, just send the email. Uh, or, or if you've already sent it, then we'll make sure that we find that but we need to make sure that our existing members are in compliance. And then for our newer members, since we, we now have uh, three of you that will be full new members at our next meeting, um, you have six months from your date of appointment to um, complete all of your required initial training. That's, uh, you know, there, there's a, a significant list of those trainings. Most of them are PowerPoint presentations, uh, things of that sort, uh, documents that you can read at your own leisure in your home. So uh, please stay current with those and complete those as soon as possible and make sure that we're, we're getting those completed so that we stay in compliance with the, the monitor and, and uh, the powers that be. Yes, Director Harness. I would, uh, Chair Levis, I would also add that uh, I'm still missing the required evaluation of NACOL from 2020 from board members as well. So I believe the NACOL training is uh, listed as an optional training. Is that, am I incorrect at that? Chair sure, Levis, it is a recommended training um, and it is has been used to uh, meet the eight, eight hours of annual training requirement for ongoing board members and uh, in order to gain compliance with the monitoring team 
the solution was to provide an essay regarding the webinars, in this case for 2020, because of the presentation, uh, for the webinars that were attended and then how you will apply what you've learned to your oversight position here in Albuquerque. And uh, as yet, I've only received two of those. Thank you for that update, Director Harness. Um, so I'll go ahead and open this up to any discussion or comments if anybody has questions here. Uh, Member Mitchell, you're up first. Well, I, I didn't do any of the NACO stuff this year, so I wouldn't have any comments about NACO. <laughs> yes, Chair uh, Olivas, Member Mitchell. Member Mitchell, you were exempted for 2020 because uh, you were uh, tasked with the uh, six months of training. And so the monitoring team deemed that it was not necessary for you to attend NACOL and then therefore present an essay. Uh, Member Nixon. I have completed looking at all the PowerPoints. Now I'm trying to track down uh, the videos. So I'll look on the, the SharePoint again, but I'm almost positive I'm, I'm just about done with all the trainings. And that's from your, your email that you'd sent last time, Eric, I think last month. Okay. Thank you, Member Nixon. Um, for myself, I, I don't have any, well, I, I think I, I remain concerned about this uh, essay issue. And I think we've talked about this before as a board, this is a requirement that's not in the CASA, it's not in the ordinance. Um, and it was never discussed with the board. I understand that it was discussed with or, or agreed to by the investigators at the agency or by the agency on their behalf. Um, but I think that that remains a challenge for the board uh, given the independence of the board and uh, also given the fact that this is not a required training yet it apparently is a required training by the eight hour requirement. So. Um, uh, we're not, we have not been presented with any alternative means to uh, complete that training during that time period. And I realized that 2020 was a, a challenging time to procure that sort of training, any sort of training given the pandemic issues. So uh, this isn't a criticism of the director or the agency per se. I really think this, this goes to the monitoring team and uh, that, you know, I think that we need to have some some discussion here. And I think this is an issue that uh, as a board, we need to take some action on in, in starting that discussion and, and making sure that we can uh, protect our independence and, uh, and also recognize the members have limited time. And uh, you know, this, this is a, a bit of a significant requirement in addition to our other job duties. Member Ralph. I have no comment, thank you. Member Amy Um, I, I'm in agreement with the things you just talked about, the, the concerns about the essay requirement. It was also, it was also presented after um, NACL was over, I believe. And it was like, go back and, and do these, uh, do an essay on, on what you watched. Um, so it felt a little backwards to not have been told ahead of time that that was a goal. Um, it might have made it easier to, you know, potentially could have taken notes while watching um, on my computer and it might have made the time demand easier. But going back now and trying to create an essay around the presentations that were watched at that time, it, does, it just doesn't feel like a priority in, in my life. Like I'm, I'm trying to figure out how to keep the demands of this board combined with the demands of my family life, combined with my work life, combined with my other volunteer activities and, and to have something added on in the end that wasn't agreed to in the beginning feels like, a, like it's not, like there's not respect for our time. Um, so that, that's where I stand on that. And no, I haven't written an essay on it. Um, uh, other than that, in the training list that you sent me, I know that I, I responded with all of the, um, the Citizen Academy 
um, sessions that I did attend that I that I know I attended. Um, so I don't know if there's an outstanding list of things that you know holes in that that need to be addressed because I don't know what the whole list of required ones were. It wasn't attend every single um, Citizen Academy session. It was like a sub list and the sub list changed from the first year to the second when the first one was canceled and the second one started. Um, I guess it was the second one for me that was canceled. So anyway, I don't know if there are outstanding things because I didn't hear back that, oh wait, you're still missing X, Y, or Z in that, in that regard for those. Um, and I did do all of the, uh, all of the sit and look through the SharePoint thing and go through the PowerPoints um, way back when Ed and I first had some email exchanges about what are the requirements left? What do I need to make sure that I accomplish? And, um, and he gave me feedback on what those things were in the share drive. And I did those and that was you know probably a year ago. Um, I don't have a date for those though. I think it was probably closer to two years ago, given you and I came on the board around the same time. And I think we were doing the same things, but um, I, I had the same issue as far as uh, that, that goes. But um, member Galloway. So um, chalk it up to my type A people pleasing personality. I did manage to get that essay off to <laughs> Director Harness, but I share your reservations. Um, and I think mine are less to the time commitment and more to the respect issue that member Armijo Pruitt just um, alluded to. I think to ask us to prove that we have done the work that we have done is insulting. I just think it's um, we are chosen, we work hard, we dedicate a lot of time and to be, to be put in a position of high school and prove what you learned is um, really unfortunate, I think, uh, to, the, to the volunteer time that we put into this and the level of professionalism that we bring to this. And so while I, I, I know we've done this a few times in this board, um, context. I think this is a conversation for Dan when they're in town. Um, and I think that that's where, where the challenge lies. This isn't with the agency. Um, I think it's well within Director Harness's uh, purview to ask that requirement be met of his investigative stuff. Um, but I think that they're two separate animals. Sorry, Member Johnson. Um, I have uh, no comment at this time. Thank you. Any further discussion here? I think Vice Chair Galloway raised a good point there as we're uh, meeting with the monitoring team when they're in town. Um, this is certainly a, a relevant issue to broach, uh, especially as Member Galloway is looking at presenting some potential changes to required training or, or requesting changes to required training because some of that is ordinance or, or um, CASA based. But I think that, that that's a conversation as individual members that we can certainly have. And I don't think it obligates the board to anything. And, and particularly since the board wasn't involved in the original conversation to impose this piece, um, I, I think that we're well within our, our rights to, uh, to ask questions on that and, and uh, advocate for for some relief there so we'll go ahead and conclude this item item f if we don't have any further discussion and move on to item g board member training um i actually don't think we have any action on this uh that i think that we've discussed that quite a bit in the in the previous section and and i think those kind of bled together in in the discussion that i wanted to have here but I think my, my intention here was that um, one of the issues we should be looking at going forward is what training is needed, what training is versus what training is required. Uh, our new members certainly have, you know, uh, a, a perspective on that as do our um, existing members and, and sort of what those needs are, what needs are unmet and what needs um, or what things seem unnecessary or unneeded. So I think that those are, those are issues that we need to be cognizant of and, and begin to collect our thoughts on that as, as we uh, look to try to, to ask for some relief or, or potential changes in that area. 
And I would just offer an update there on that as well, that member Galloway, uh, Vice Chair Galloway and I are uh, going to be scheduling a meeting shortly with um, Office of Equity Inclusion to uh, look further at what kinds of specialized training options they can offer us and, and what their uh, specialized vendors can, can offer as far as diversity and inclusion training that we've discussed here several times. Any discussion or questions on this item? Uh, yes, Member Johnson. Yes, um, I think more of a, a statement. Um, I'm I'm very motivated to to help um, on this committee, so I don't see me going anywhere. But I really think that maybe an idea, and I'm just throwing it around, is to give new members two to three months to complete the, and I know it says six, but I mean to fully focus, maybe a couple of months to fully focus on the training so that they can become really confident, active members. I think when you're coming on, it seems like it's a lot going on. There's a lot that you have to learn as far as the names, the players, the people, and Mr. And, uh, Mr. Harness, he's been very good at emailing me back because I, I was like, where am I supposed to start with the training? And uh, also uh, Chantel, when, way before a long time ago, uh, maybe a couple months ago, she emailed me and said, hey, I know that this can be a little bit trying. And so uh, if you have any help, please let me, or if you need any help, please let me know. And I think that that would give people more confidence because when I was listening to uh, board member Ralph, um, you know, she, she made some valid points that you're going, okay, yes and no. And then I heard all the responses, even from the council, um, some great responses, but I, I think that if you, if we want to fully, and I'm not trying to tell you what to do, right? It's just conversation. I believe that if we want a fully um, confident board and, and, and people that know what they're doing, that maybe that might be something that may be brought up. I was listening to the gentleman earlier, the CPC, he said that he gave a packet and, you know, see like they were trying to really implement the people in and say, okay, not boosh here you go here's everything and so you know you work through it do the best you can and you know vote uh what it is that you may want to vote so i think as far as the training because i'm still on that subject i think that if you gave them enough time to really get into the training it would be completed it wouldn't be spread out over six months a year year and a half or however long it takes and uh we would make sure that the board it's fully functional. So I guess it's just more of a thought um, than anything. So thank you for uh, hearing me out. Any other discussion on this? Uh, yes, member Amiho Um, It might be, it might be useful in these, like to get at the, the piece about the essays and all that. And I know we said we'd talk about that in another, in another venue at another day, but um, I mean, what if we had something where, okay, you attend these, you know, NACL, we know when it happens. What if we had a meeting that on, you know, on our agenda was that we discussed the highlights of it so that everybody can sort of, you know, show that they attended, that they learned something and we can learn from each other about the perspectives that they had with, from that information. I think there are other ways around um, essays that are just putting stuff out into the void that doesn't really connect everybody um, to the content and how it really does should apply to this work, right? If we if we were more intentional about that, I know we um, you know we have to notice meetings when we meet. But if we if we are doing retreats or we're doing mediations or we're doing whatever else that we've met separately, we could do something like that after NACOL ended um, as well. Just an idea to to make that more useful. Um, I think there was a, an email sent out at one point a while back when it was, um, what did you guys think about the, the applicants for the, the chief job, right, that was on there? And so I sat down and I wrote all kinds of stuff and then that goes off into the void and, you know, nothing. And I thought, okay, well, I guess that wasn't going to be a conversation. And I know we have to, we can't really have a rolling quorum and all of that, but, but those things like, I'm not sure what writing them up does other than ch check a box, tick a box for somebody. Whereas we really could use these as learning experiences with each other and, and set the direction 
and the tone and um, uh, for, for us, for ourselves. So just something to think about. Thank you, member Emil Pruitt. Other discussion here? Not seeing any. Um, I, I really like that idea. And I think that I, I kind of think back to Vice Chair Galloway's question to the K-9 unit where she was talking about, you know, potentially setting up uh, a more intensive training, a more, you know, uh, where it, we'd potentially be talking about the whole suite of, of special, um, not special ops, but uh, special units, uh, munitions and tactical and all that kind of stuff. Um, and I can see where that would then, you know, the members that went to that, maybe not everybody goes, but they come back to the meeting and, and very similar to that presentation, they're able to present to the board and uh, talk about what they learned, what they saw, what they didn't see, what they'd like to know. And, um, you know, as, as chair, since I, I make the agenda, I think that's something that we can always put on uh, on an agenda. If a member has a, a training that they attended or an event that they attended that they want to talk about, uh, let me know. And I'm happy to to consider that and put it on the agenda. The, the only caveat there being if we have, you know, nine members and nine members happen to go to nine different things, you know, we may need to spread those out a little bit. Uh, but I think that that's a, that's a great idea. And it's something we can work within our existing system for to make that happen. And we can probably get creative about it too, as far as what events are, are training events. And then um, I'm, I'm trying to think back here because I had a question for member Johnson on, um, on your thoughts or, or proposal there. So were you, you know, are you saying that you think it would be helpful to sort of participate as a an observing member for three months instead of one month or, or um, I'm just trying to think of, of, you know, how that would be structured and how that would, what, what that would look like. Yeah. That, you know, that, that would be a thought maybe one month or like two months or three months be an observing member, but you're still going through, you're still learning uh, how everything works because I, like I said, I'm in, but I was, I'm sitting here thinking about the process. And like uh, member Pruitt was stating, you know, um, you know, there's, it, there's a, you know, there's so many other things that are going on in a lot of people's lives. And when I kind of feel like if there, if there is a high turnover, you know, I don't know how long it is. I haven't been on this board long enough, but I'm, uh, I'm thinking, you know, back when I was uh, running companies, um, it was usually closer during the part of the, the hiring process that that the turnover was the highest because they were, you know, for whatever reason. And I believe that the training so far as how I've seen, like I said, I'm not, I don't want to come off as someone that's being critical. I just want to kind of help everyone stay and everyone be confident. But, you know, Dr. Harness, he went with me, uh, me and member Ralph, myself and member Ralph um, over the IMR reports and the different things. And I think Chantel actually, uh, was on that one. And then um, after that, it was kind of like, what's next? And so I, I believe that I, and then when I reached out to him, he sent me an email right back saying, hey, here's a link. You're going to have to check this out. Then they end up giving me um, um, an email. And now I'm going to go pick up, like I said, the tablet tomorrow. But I'm just thinking that if if we're still voting, if I'm not mistaken, I remember reading where it had to be like a majority. So if there's nine, if I'm not mistaken, I think it had to be six, if it's eight, five, I, I don't remember the exact numbers, but you know, if it was like three, then two had the vote. And so it be, might be a good idea just to have them ease them into that process. Um, like I said, I'm not trying to reinvent the wheel. I'm just trying to help, to be honest, on, on trying to keep, retain members, but still make it to where they're confident when they're doing these things. So. I hope that it doesn't come off as as um, being critical of what of the training or anything like that. Thank you. I, th I think that helps a lot. And you know, as we as we continue with these discussions, because we do have this the city council work group with the city attorney and such, uh, I think those are important perspectives to to bring to the table. That there's and and the perspectives of. The newer members are going to be different than the perspectives of, of those of us that have been around here longer and 
um, not at all. I think you're, you're well within, uh, you know, it's a very valid point and I, I appreciate your perspective. And um, I think we, we've got to try to incorporate that into our, our request on this. And as, as we make this sort of a bigger issue to kind of reform the training and onboarding process and uh, kudos to Vice Chair Galloway. I know that she does a lot of a lot of the heavy lifting there and in, in onboarding people and, and getting people where they need to be and, and of course director harness as well so thank you guys for that any further discussion here uh, I'll, I'll make sure that this gets on another agenda item because i don't think this this training issue is done i think this is just starting and this is a good discussion to kind of start this out so we can keep this going and uh, build a more a more full argument of, of what we want, what our case is. We'll go ahead and conclude item G, board member training, and move on to item H, CPOA board subcommittee minutes and signatures. This uh, is my item. This is really a, a housekeeping item, and I believe Director Harness actually solved this in his presentation for the agency, stating that we're going to have um, signatures sent out in batches to subcommittee chairs and presumably board chair through DocuSign. The issue here was, I guess, that uh, this was presented by board staff that uh, some chairs were physically signing papers and scanning them in. Some chairs uh, wanted to DocuSign, other chairs were electronically signing. So we had three different signature methods. Um, some, some subcommittees were not having minutes or uh, minutes taken at all. But I think that uh, what Director Harness presented deals with this item, unless there's any further discussion from uh, from members. Seeing none, I think we can move on to item I, update on the case review process. This was an item that we authorized council uh, previously to investigate. And uh, this is uh, Attorney Gucci's chance to update us on what's going on here. Uh, Chair Olivas, Honorable Board, as with my other update, the update is there is no update, but it's not for want of trying and it is on the agenda and we are working with Department of Justice and City Legal to get this moving in the right direction, if you will. And, and really this, this is a long-term project because what we have is the CASA that probably doesn't speak to the issue, but I'm working with the parties to confirm that. We have an ordinance that probably is gonna require some kind of a rewrite or some kind of instruction from city council to allow this case review process to change from what it's traditionally done. That all being said, um, I my understanding from my last communication with the city attorney is that they've not forgotten about me and us and that we are going to get this moving. And I hope by next board meeting, I have a more substantive update to give you all. Uh, any discussion or questions for Attorney Gooch? And I did uh, raise this issue in, in our meeting with uh, DOJ representatives as well, just making sure that this is on the on the radar. I believe Director Harness and, and uh, Council Gooch were there as well. Uh, but uh, we raised this issue that this is uh, a, an issue of interest to us uh, as far as potentially getting some relief. I think that uh, the crux of it is, if I'm not mistaken here, that uh, this is an, an ordinance issue and will likely require, assuming the parties agree to the change, and so far we haven't seemed to have any substantive pushback, but assuming the parties agree, um, this is a, a, an ordinance amendment that, you know, at some point we would likely need to present to a, a sponsor on city council to amend the ordinance to potentially even just, uh, I believe, Tina, you had said strike one word or something like that could be the, a potential solution to this. So thank you for, for your report, Councillor Gooch. And uh, I think that concludes this item unless there's any further discussion. Seeing none. Uh, this item, item J, uh, consideration of PPRB policies with no recommendation. This was an item for Dr. Cass. Do we have someone from the uh, policy subcommittee that will carry the item? Uh, 
I'm not sure what this is in reference to. I thought he presented, is it to present the, the, the actual policies that have no recommendation? Yes, yeah, so there's a, a list of policies in the report from the Policies and Procedures Subcommittee uh, that are uh, for no recommendation. Let's see, I'm pulling this up here. I didn't, I didn't look at them and prepare. I wasn't aware that um, Dr. Cass wasn't gonna be at the meeting. I, I can I can take care of it. I I, uh, I pulled it up here, and um, I'll, I'll defer to you all on the on the committee on this. But uh, these are policies that the committee, the policies and procedures subcommittee, is recommending uh, no recommendation from the board. The policies are two ten use of emergency communications, two fourteen use of cell site stimulator technology, uh, two fifteen small unmanned aircraft system operations. 3-41, complaints involving department personnel, and 3-46, discipline system. All of those were recommended by the committee for no recommendation. Uh, and I would make a motion to uh, submit, or uh, ask our representative to submit those for no recommendation. Second. Motion and a second. Do we have any discussion on these? Seeing none, Ms. Barela, could you please call the roll? Yep. Member Armeo Pruitt? Yes. Thank you. Member Galloway? Yes. Thank you. Member Johnson? Yes. Member Mitchell? Yes. Member Nixon? Yes. Member Olivas? Yes. Member Rell? Yes. Did that motion passed 7 0. Thank you, Ms. Barela. That concludes item J. We'll move on to item K, the CPOA 2020 July to December semi-annual report approval. Director Harness. Yes, Chair Levis Board, uh, you were presented with a draft of the second half of 2020 semi-annual report. Um, I would request its uh, approval to move to the city. Uh, open up discussion here as a, as a free item rather than our normal order. Do we have any discussion here? Seeing no hands, uh, as, as usual, I think it's a, a well done report and a good summary of the work of the agency. So kudos to you and your staff. No further discussion. Ms. Barela, could you please call the roll? Member Amiel Pruitt. We don't actually have a motion yet, but I'll make that motion. <laughs> that oh, I'm sorry. Right. Thanks, Chantel. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you. Okay, I heard a second there in the background. I think that was Member Mitchell. Uh, my apologies there. Any discussion? Seeing none, Ms. Barilla, could you please call the roll? Yes. Member Armio Pruitt? Yes. Member Galloway? Yes. Thank you, Member Johnson? Yes. Member Mitchell? Yes. Member Nixon? Yes. Member Olivas? Yes. Member Rell? Yes. Thank you. That motion passed 7 0. Thank you, Ms. Barrello. Director Harness, just let us know if you need anything else on that for your presentation to council. Uh, item L, we have the executive director's job description approval. I'm carrying this item. This is an item out of the uh, personnel committee given changes in the city's HR process over the years and changes to the ordinance. We do have uh, the job description up for approval at this time and the committee has recommended that the board adopt the, uh, the language um, as drafted. Uh, so I would make a motion that we approve the executive director's job description as drafted. Second. So we have a motion and a second. Uh, this is an opportunity for discussion. I would also add that we have um, city HR attorney, Melissa Kuntz here for any uh, HR type questions here. Just a reminder to board members to be cognizant of uh, issues that may be privileged and should be discussed in closed session. This shouldn't get close to any of that, but if there are uh, any, any issues like that, I think just be aware and, and uh, attorney Gooch and I and, and Ms. Kuntz will also uh, try to help with that 
At this time, I'd like to go ahead and make an amendment to uh, strike any language referring to the uh, Police Oversight Board and insert the Civilian Police Oversight Agency Board. I'll second that. Motion and a second. Do we have any discussion on the amendment? Seeing none, uh, Ms. Borelli, could you please call the roll? Member Amio Pruitt? Yes. Member Galloway? Yes. Member Johnson? Yes. Member Mitchell? Yes. Member Nixon? Yes. Member Olivas? Yes. Member Ralph? Member Ralph? Yes, I'm sorry, I couldn't get it off mute, I'm sorry. Oh, that's good. That motion passed seven zero. Thank, thank you. Okay, so the amended job description updates the uh, title of the board to the current title in the current ordinance of the Police Oversight Agency Board. Do we have any further discussion uh, or changes to the job description? Yeah, I have uh, something I'd like to have a conversation around at least. Member Mitchell. Um, so I would move, um, and let, let me preface my remarks by I'm assuming that when that job description was drafted, it was drafted for a contract relationship and that it was a problem, I'm guessing it was initially drafted when a lot of this work started. I think um, based on my year and a half on the board, there seems to be some tension between um, board responsibility and agency responsibility. So with that said, I would offer um, the following language. And again, I'm not wedded to this language, uh, but I think this might get us closer to um, um, clarifying some, some roles. So anyway, what I wrote, what I have written down is to facilitate the oversight function of the police oversight board, the executive director will provide related reports as requested, implement procedures um, as requested, or provide alternative recommendations for consideration to the police oversight board and any other information within specified time frames unless otherwise agreed to and modified by the police oversight board. And I, I think we've had, I think there's gray area here in terms of, I don't wanna manage the, the agency at all, but I also think we have a responsibility to do oversight and it's our responsibility to decide what information we need to do oversight, which may bleed over a little bit into the into the functions of the agency. So I'm not exactly positive if this is the right language to get us there, but I think we have an opportunity now to create a job description that more clearly defines those roles uh, or, or, and, and helps uh, move us forward. I'll, I think that was a, in the form of motion, I'll second that. Um, and so opening up discussion here, I don't, I, I want to first turn to our attorneys if they have any uh, comments or, or questions on that language or, or, you know, what that does. I'd be happy to hear. Uh, Chair Levis, members of the board, I would actually recommend uh, tabling that and having the personnel subcommittee take a closer look at it and just make sure that it doesn't run afoul of any of the provisions in the ordinance that created the board and also reflects the board's purpose and definitions in the CASA. So we have a, a recommendation to table the job description approval and consider the uh, proposed amendment in the personnel subcommittee. Um, I'm happy to, to sponsor that motion to, to table this item and refer it to the personnel subcommittee. Second. We have a motion in a second. Eric, sorry, uh, if we could just sorry, if we could just back up. What about the the motion in the second? Is it's going to withdraw? I just want to make sure for the record that we're that we're addressing. So we have a motion to table. I believe a motion to table moves uh, ahead of the the motion. On. I'm looking at my Robert's rules here, uh, Councillor Gooch. If you have any. Chair Levis, Honorable Board, um, I, I don't know the answer. I could look it up if you'd like, or we could, 
who are, who motioned it was to member Mitchell. Is that who's motion? Yes, yeah, an amendment by member Mitchell. Um, I guess that the other thing is if member Mitchell would like to amend or withdraw his motion or amend it to table, um, that would be another procedural way to get around this while I look up the Roberts rules on that. Well, I believe the language needs to be worked on for sure. I just don't want to miss the opportunity to get this job description right. And so I'm not prepared to vote yes in the affirmative right now for the job description. And I also think while we have some sensitivity around the time, uh, I think we have time to be a little more deliberative about this. So are you uh, comfortable withdrawing your amendment? Yes. Okay. So the original motion, uh, I'll, I'll go ahead and withdraw my uh, tabling as well. I think the easiest way to just deal with this is to vote on the original motion and then we can uh, deal with member Galloway. I have a question. Um, I would like to be able to discuss this a little bit, but I do believe that it would require a closed session. Um, and so I don't know if we want to table and send comments or concerns to you as, uh, to Chair Olivas as the chair of the personnel subcommittee, or if we want to start a dialogue in closed session. Um, we have an item on our agenda for personnel matter. Um, so I'm, I'm happy to do either, but I would like to talk. I would recognize our attorneys here, Councillor Gooch. Um, Chair Levis, Honorable Board, if the board believes that this warrants a closed session for discussion with your council, um, it's been noticed as such, but you all can take a vote to move into closed session for the limited purpose about talking about this job description. Um, to the extent you're looking for legal advice, I mean, I guess what I need to know more from uh, Member Galloway is, and this is a very hard question to ask without waiving privilege, but is the reason for wanting a closed session to discuss a personnel matter specific to the current director or is it to discuss this particular job description? Because if it's the latter, I don't know that a closed session is appropriate. If it's regarding the executive director or a personnel matter, then it would be appropriate for a closed session. But it is a yeah, it's a personnel matter. Um, but I'm, I think, I think that for ease, why don't we just send, uh, if it's all right, send any comments um, or concerns to the personnel chair instead of me talking. I'll just do that if that's acceptable. Okay, so that that brings us back to the. Original motion, having withdrawn the amendment and the, the proposal to table, uh, which is to approve this job description. Um, so a vote in the affirmative is to advance this. A vote in the no will um, not advance this. Any further discussion on this? Uh, Ms. Barilo, would you please call the roll? Mem Member Armiel Pruitt? No. Member Galloway? No. Member Johnson? No. Member Mitchell? No. Member Nixon? No. Member Olivas? No. Member Ralph? No. Was that a no? Okay, uh, that motion failed 07, thank you. Okay, so I will go ahead and refer this issue to the personnel subcommittee and encourage members that have any further comments on the job description uh, or the proposed change to uh, send those to myself, the chair of the personnel subcommittee. And uh, I would also ask that uh, member Mitchell, if you could potentially uh, email that language to, the, to, the, to myself or to the rest of the board and, and it's easier if you just do it um, so that everyone has that language and can, can offer comment to the, to the subcommittee on that if that's appropriate. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so we'll go ahead and move on. I'm sorry, was there something else? Okay. Um, 
Item M, CPOA, CPOAB, Legal Services Contract Renewal. Uh, Director Harness, I'll let you introduce this item. Uh, yes, Chair uh, Board, uh, you've received a red line version of the contract that uh, for representation by uh, Attorney Gucci's firm, Sutton Thayer and Brown, uh, we're just asking that you note those changes uh, and then you delegate uh, the chair uh, in accordance with your policies and procedures to approve that uh, contract so that we can move forward and, and not uh, have a glitch as we move into fiscal year 22. So do we have a, a motion on this item? Motion to approve the contract presented by Sutton Thayer and Brown for legal services. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion on this item? <laughs> Seeing none, uh, Ms. Borella, could you please call the roll? Member Romeo Pruitt? Yes. Member Galloway? Yes. Member Johnson? Yes. Member Mitchell? Yes. Member Nixon? Yes. Member Olivas? Yes. Member Ralph? Yes. Okay, that motion passed 7 0. Thank you, Ms. Barella. That concludes item M, moving on to item N. CPOAB role to increase timeline compliance for CPOA investigations. Uh, this is a motion that I would like to make to the board. Uh, the motion was sent out in advance, but I'll go ahead and read the motion into the record. Uh, for the purpose of reducing the investigative burden on the CPOA and bring the civilian police complaint process in Albuquerque into line with nationwide standard best practices. I hereby make a motion for the CPA bo CPOA board two. Number one, authorize the policies and procedures subcommittee to recommend a policy change to 3-41 to allow minor violations to be referred to area command for investigation by the CPOA as allowed by IAPS. Number two, authorize the policies and procedures subcommittee to utilize the services of legal counsel to author an amendment to the CASA placing a statute of limitations on civilian police complaints. And number three, authorize the board chair to author a letter to the city council and the CAO of the city of Albuquerque to request they negotiate expanded time limitations with the APOA to allow for 180 day disciplinary timelines as a standard practice in similar jurisdictions nationwide. We have a motion, do we have a second? Second. We have a motion and a second. Uh, discussion on this item. I'll go ahead and go back to the order here. Uh, Member Nixon, you'll be first up. No comment. Uh, my, I recognize myself next. Um, my thinking on this, this is something that was recommended by the agency to uh, include the board in the process of assisting the agency in accomplishing its goals and its uh, mandated timelines. And uh, I think that there is uh, certainly a role here to be played by the board. So I hope that we can support starting this process, which is really what this is. I don't think it commits the, the board to anything. It uh, asks our subcommittees to um, draft changes to policies or, uh, or draft changes to the CASA, proposed changes to the CASA, um, and also uh, authorizes the chair to uh, request uh, extending timeline limitations for the APOA in their uh, collective bargaining negotiations. Member Ruff. No comment, I'm sorry. Thank you, Member Ralph. Member Amiho Pruitt. I'm in support of them. Thank you. Member Galloway. Um, the 180 day disciplinary timeline. Um, there was something that was said in the hearing yesterday about uh, a certain amount of time not being um, counted in the 120 day review period, investigative period for complaints. And I'm sure that's with uh, internal affairs, but that, does that apply to CPOA investigations as well? Director Harness? Chair Levis, uh, Vice Chair Galloway, I'm not sure to 
what to which you are referring. However, our timelines are the same timelines as internal affairs professional standards and internal affairs uh, force division uh, because they are dictated by the collective bargaining agreement. And perhaps what I'm thinking of um, now that I asked that question is the proposed changes that Mr. Willoughby had indicated um, had been agreed to in theory and then there was a pause and then it came back and the city was asking for different things. So maybe I'm thinking about that. Um, so right now we're sitting at 120 days from the time the complaint is filed until disciplinary action. Is that accurate? Uh, Chair Gallo, I'm sorry, Chair Olivas, Vice Chair Galloway. No, that is, that is not correct. Uh, 90 plus 30, we have, right? We have, um, uh, we have a seven day preliminary review period that we're allowed before we uh, assign a case number. And once the case number is assigned, that starts the clock. So we have 90 days plus a one time 30 day extension. And then there is contemplated in that the 30 day review period. So discipline is imposed after 150 days. Okay, thank you. So the, um, I just have a, a clarifying question there. So the I number and the CPC number, basically the same rules apply. As soon as there's a number pulled, uh, the, the clock starts. Chair Levis, that's, that's correct. Understood. Uh, Member Johnson. I have uh, no comment at this time, thank you. And Member Mitchell. Yeah, I fully support, um, I think the agency does a really good job of of handling these lower level complaints. And um, I'm not sure that it's a productive time for us to look at a lot of this stuff. So anything that manages that differently, I, I'm in favor of. Any further discussion, comments, questions? Seeing none, Ms. Borela, could you please call the roll? Member Armio Pritt? Yes. Member Galloway? Yes. Member Johnson? Yes. Member Mitchell? Yes. Member Nixon? Yes. Member Olivas? Yes. Member Rell? No. That motion passed 6 1. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Barella. This takes us to item O notification protocol for complainants for board meetings. Vice Chair Galloway. Yeah, um, I, this is on the agenda at Chair Levis's request, um, just to confirm and reiterate and make clear, I think, um, we, the board had asked the outreach subcommittee a while back to look at uh, drafting some language regarding a point of contact person for the board. Um, and inside that language, there had been conversation about who would respond to the emails at C, uh, POB at CABQ.gov um, because it seemed inappropriate. Um, and I don't wanna speak for Director Harness, but I think it was indicated that it was, he, he believed it was inappropriate for him or his designee to respond to emails at that account. Um, the board has, had discussions in the past that, that the appropriate person would be the executive director. The board has voted and approved in the past um, to delegate that responsibility to the Galloway, executive director. I apologize for the interruption here. Um, I think you're confusing this with item Q. So I think you're discussing item Q right now. Um, and we're on item O, the notification protocol for complainants. So for uh, when cases are heard. So sorry. You're good. So, so sorry. <laughs> Um, okay, so that required a, a language change to our um, policies and procedures that I believe are included um, uh, in our notes. And it says, so the language currently says um, that the, when, when a complainant's case is heard, let me back up and 
re regather my thoughts. Um, when a complainant's case is going to be heard, the board has asked that the agency notify the complainants that their case is going to be heard. Currently, our policies and procedures require that we allow complainants to speak um, as to their case. We give them, I think it says a minimum of five minutes. And that's proving to be um, problematic. I've not found that language anywhere but our policies. And I don't know if Tina can confirm that. Uh, Chair Olivas, Vice Chair Galloway, um, the policies and procedures provide that, but they track the ordinance. And the ordinance has a requirement that a complainant or the complainant's authorized representative will be provided a minimum of five minutes to address the board relating to the complaint and investigation. For a regular complaint versus a, um, a appeal? Um, I can look up appeal, but for a complaint, it's five minutes. Okay. Um, let me look up appeal. If it's under that, it doesn't matter. You don't need to do that. Um, if it's tracking that, then I actually am going to withdraw this because I didn't see that in the poll in the ordinance. So forgive me. Okay. Uh, we didn't have a motion here yet, but uh, we have a request to withdraw from the sponsor, which we can go ahead and honor. And I would, uh, I would say that that gets lumped in with uh, what you're already working on, Tina, because I think it's very closely related as we're looking at how we can change the complaint process. Uh, we certainly would have to look at how we change the complainant uh, notification and opportunity to uh, present to the board process. So um, I think that wraps up this item, but if there is any further discussion or uh, anyone that wants to comment or, or ask questions on this, I think we can recognize that at this time. Seeing none. Um, at this point in time, I would actually like to uh, offer a motion to reconsider. Uh, this is going to be for item M, the legal services contract. I believe there's an issue. Well, uh, first of all, I'll offer the motion to reconsider. Do we have a second? Second. Um, the issue that I see here is that this we've already approved this contract once. This is the second approval. Um, and uh, it is the guidance of staff and, and everyone involved at the agency that this could change again, given changes in city purchasing that we already heard about earlier with Ed. So I would like to reconsider the motion um, and then re-offer it with the change that this be delegated to the board chair to finalize the contract. Would that be appropriate, Attorney Gooch, to, to consider it in that way? Uh, Chair Levis, yes, that's appropriate. Okay, so I believe the motion to reconsider will allow us to go back to that item and then we would need to um, vote, ag vote against, vote down that item and offer it again. Is that correct? Just making sure. Okay, great. So we have motion and a second, any discussion? Seeing none, Ms. Barilla, could you call the roll on the motion to reconsider? Uh, yes, and that's item M, correct? Yes, item M. Just want to make sure. Okay, um, member Armia Pruitt? Yes. Okay. Member Galloway? Yes. Member Johnson? Yes. Member Mitchell? Yes. Member Nixon? Yes. Member Olivas? Yes. Member Rell? Yes. That motion passed seven zero. Thank you. Okay, so we move back to item M, the legal services contract renewal. Um, sorry, Tina, one more question. Can we just amend this now since we're on the motion again? Or do we have to yes. vote? Yes. Okay. Uh, so I would like to offer an amendment to the motion to delegate final uh, approval of the contract to the board chair. Second. Motion and a second. Any discussion on the amendment? Seeing none, Ms. Barley, could you call the roll? Yes, member Amiel Pruitt? Yes. Member Galloway? Member Galloway? 
Sorry, yes. Member Johnson? Yes. Member Mitchell? Yes. Member Nixon? I mute. Yes. Thank you. Member Leibus? Yes. Member Ralph? Yes. And that motion passed 7 0. Thank you. And just a reminder to board members to uh, please leave your camera on if you're in the if you're in the room and, and uh, participating in the meeting. Um, that takes us to the original motion. We have a well, uh, we're reconsidering the motion, so there is a motion and a second. Any further discussion on the amended motion? Seeing none, uh, Ms. Barrela, one more roll call, please. Member Armio Pruitt? Yes. Member Galloway? Yes. Okay. Member Johnson? Yes. Member Mitchell? Yes. Member Nixon? Yes. Member Olivas? Yes. Member Ralph? Yes. Thank you. That motion passed 7 0. Thank you, Ms. Barella. Sorry about that, everyone. I, but I think that saves us having to vote on this potentially again in a future meeting and, and again and again. So um, that takes us back to, let me make sure I've got my place here. We concluded item O, item P, training for board members on CPOA investigations. This is uh, a motion that I would like to make. I'd like to make a motion that the director of the CPOA be, and uh, I'm sorry, it should be the director of the CPOA or his or her designee plan and offer a training to all CPOA be members on the CPOA civilian police complaint process, including intake, assignment, investigation, and conclusion, no later than 73121. Uh, the purpose of this training shall be to familiarize board members with the complaint process and how the agency handles complaints so that board members may make informed decisions when reviewing agency findings as required by ordinance. Second. We have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion on the item? Member Armijo Pruitt. Are you saying that the plan and the training needs to occur by 731? Let me review the language real quick here. It does read as plan and offer, but I think we could we could clean that up if there's desire to. I think um, by 731, a plan is reasonable. Um, I, I'm not sure implementation by 731 is is reasonable just even in terms of getting everybody on the same page about a date and the process. Would you like to offer, I'm so, uh, we did have a motion and a second, I believe. Would you like to offer an amendment? So I, I'd like to offer an amendment that the, um, that the plan be uh, created by 731. Um, and then I think <laughs> I'm gonna leave it at that. With, and remove the, the requirement that it be implemented or offered by that time. Uh, and I don't want to speak for the director, but I believe based on our current um, updates on kind of where this has been in the past, I think there is roughly a plan on this, um, but I would defer to the director on, on where this stands. Uh, Chair Olivas, uh, board, as I presented before, yes, there is a, uh, an outline for the training. And as I have also expressed to the board, uh, the, the providing of the, the, the pro providing this training based upon the workload of the agency and the training of new investigators as they're coming on board uh, for the agency and for myself is not a priority. Uh, I do not understand how this uh, furthers the mission of the board in oversight of the Albuquerque Police Department. And given the information that you now are provided for each investigation, I'm not sure how this aids you in reaching a conclusion based upon the findings as being presented uh, from the agency. So, uh, I mean, I would oppose this given the fact that I have already given you a projected timeline that it could happen uh, sometime in mid, uh, probably late, late 2021 or, or early 2022 based upon the need to train new investigators with our workload. 
uh, further, uh, this, this body wants to get out of the case review business. So what's the purpose of, uh, of this training uh, at this point? And so those are my, those are my points. So member Armijo Pruitt, I was just trying to help you kind of decide what you want to do with the amendment there. Um, um, I guess, oh, I mean, we're the, the trainings that we're, we go through, um, you know, dog bite process, like there are all kinds of things that are not necessarily going to apply to every thing we do on the board, but it gives us a broader understanding of process, our role in this whole overarching process and, and what each piece looks like. So to me, I do see, um, and I think the rest of the board, I don't want to speak for everybody, but we have discussed this a lot. I think we do see value in that training. And I would hope that there would be some way to dovetail um, your new investigator training with training us. I mean, um, it seems like some, some component of what is offered to the new investigators could be offered to us. Um, so I, I guess I, um, you know, I, I would like to, that, that I would, my, my preference would be that the amend, that it, the motion be amended to a plan by 731 with a, a date of training, um, included in the plan, but that the training itself doesn't have to happen by then, um, and then maybe some some longer period of time for the training to happen. But but saying that it's going to be, I think originally it was like middle or late 2022 is the first thing that was discussed, which feels like way, you know, I mean, some of our terms will be over by then. And it, it, it doesn't seem like this is too much to ask. I know that you and your staff have a very um, heavy workload. I understand that. But it seems like there's got to be a way to make this work for everybody. Um, so I guess my amendment would be that by 731, a plan be presented um, that includes a date and the date to not be, um, that the date must be within the, the, this year of 2021 for an actual training. Okay, so we, we have an amendment. Um, well, for your consideration, what if we just changed it to 1231 for the whole thing? Okay. Plan and offer. Um, okay. So could you, could you restate the amendment? Sorry. So the amendment would be to change the date for the requirements to 1221, 12, 2021. 12, 31, 21. Right. 12, 31, 2021. <laughs> Lots of one. <laughs> uh, I'll second that. I Any discussion on the amendment? change the date to 1231 for a plan and offering the training. Seeing none, uh, Ms. Borella, could you please call the roll? Member Armio Pruitt? Yes. Member Galloway? Yes. Member Johnson? Yes. Member Mitchell? Yes. Member Nixon? Yes. Member Olivas? Yes. Member Ralph? Yes. Thank you, that motion passed seven zero. Okay, the original motion has been amended to reflect a change in the date to 12-31-21 from 7-31-21. Uh, so now the original motion is on the floor and I'll open up discussion um, in our order. I'll, member Ralph, sorry. I have no comment. Thank you, member Amy Hilpro. I have nothing more, thank you. Vice Chair Galloway. I think that my only comment is it's discouraging to me to hear that this is not a priority of the executive director and the agency when this request is a direct result of the ask of the investigative staff <laughs> two years ago that we undergo this training. Um, and so for two years, we have been asking for it to push it out another year is uncomfortable to push it out another six months is uncomfortable to me to be honest um this was important to the investigative staff it was a valid and fair criticism of the board that we did not understand 
what goes into an investigation. And I am disheartened to hear that it is not a priority. So. Member Johnson. I have no comment at this time. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Member Mitchell. No, the, the only comment I would have was having just completed the Civilian Police Academy. Um, I don't expect I'll ever go out and arrest anybody, but it sure was very valuable information for me to understand, you know, the whole dynamics of that work. Uh, and I would think similarly situated in terms of the investigation. We're not going to do the investigation, but I do think it creates a sensitivity around all of us if we better understand the, the, the dynamics of the investigation and the challenges that those dynamics present. Thank you. And member Nixon. No comment. And I'll recognize myself. Um, I'm not thrilled about taking it to December, but I think it's better than um, next December. So I, I think that's a that's a happy medium, uh, but it has been a long time coming. And I think, uh, well, I, I recognize the director's point that uh, this may not be an issue because there is a chance that we change the ordinance or, or get the ordinance changed to remove this requirement. Uh, we will still have uh, appeals in, in you know, what our preferred role is here and we will still be supervisors of the director who supervises the agency that performs these investigations and handles these complaints. So um, it is relevant regardless of the changes for board members to understand how these investigations are processed and how they are performed at the agency. Um, and I'm, I think I'm possibly the only member that received this training um, by my, my request, I, I sat with uh, Investigator McDermott. It was very informative and enlightening and really helped me understand the process and what we are looking at when we look at a complaint and how it got to us and all the pieces that went into it. And I think that um, that's something that is very useful to know and helps me to make it. Um, so with that being said, that's my final comment there. Do we have any further discussion on this? Seeing none, uh, Ms. Borella, could you please call the roll? Member Armio Pruitt? Yes. Member Galloway? Yes. Member Johnson? Yes. Member Mitchell? Yes. Member Nixon? Yes. Member Olivas? Yes. Member Rell? Yes. That was seven zero, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Barrela. Um, and I, I apologize, I didn't get back to this. Um, we had a question on where the second was for the, uh, was that for the amendment on that motion to change the date? Uh, no, it was, it was figured out, Eric. Okay, I'm sorry. That's okay. Um, now we'll go ahead and conclude item P and move on to item Q, protocol on responding to POB at cabq.gov emails, uh, Vice Chair Galloway. You jumped the gun on this one. Yes, I did, and forgive me for that. Um, but all of that holds true. The board had discussed and requested and decided and requested that the executive director or his appointee be the appropriate person to respond to those um, emails at the POB at cabq.gov. The board subsequently voted on it and approved that that would be um, the direction that that should be handled. It was provided in writing to the executive director a couple of times. It was requested by the agency, by, by the executive director, that the board reconsider that. That language for reconsideration was included in the um, changes we had last month uh, in the, or maybe the month before, in the point of contact for, uh, as a board spokesperson, um, there was a lot of discussion around that topic and ultimately decided to pull the recommended language of that, that POC being the person to respond to emails at that account. And that, um, role was approved by the board without that, which leaves the response to emails squarely within 
the purview of the executive director or his or her designee. So just to clarify, if there's any confusion about whose responsibility that is, the board reconsidered and the board decided that it was best to stay where it was. Any discussion or questions on this item? So just to clarify then one more time, that is not in the outreach committee. That's not something outreach is considered. It moved out of outreach, came before the board and was um, removed. Director Harness. Chair Oliva, so then uh, the answering, the timeline, the decision to answer, to not answer, those are all left within my discretion and the board has no say in that at this point. No, it was, uh, there is a timeline that was in within the, the original motion. I don't have that language, it's years old now, um, but I can find it if it's necessary. There is a time in which the executive director, in fact, I think it's in, um, I'll find it. Uh, I think it may be within the policies and procedures. I'm not positive about that, but there is language somewhere that the executive director or his or her designee must respond to and notify the board um, by within a week or 10 days or something. I I'll find it for you. Please. Will do. If there's anything else on this item, we'll, we'll go ahead and conclude it if not. That concludes item Q and our last item in the discussion section is uh, APD SOP 298 gunshot detection procedure recommendation. This is a policy that is with the board for 30 day review. Um, and since Dr. Cass is not here, I will go ahead and carry this recommendation. I would like to make a motion that we adopt the recommendation as drafted um, as drafted and recommended by the policies and procedures subcommittee. Uh, leaving final edits to uh, the um, to Mr. Abbasi with uh, CPOA, who has uh, the has the ability to forward this to APD. I second that because I, I had that discussion with them as well. Okay, we have motion and a second. Uh, any discussion on this item? This recommendation on policy two ninety eight. Seeing none, Ms. Barela, could you please call the roll? Member Armio Pruitt? Yes. Member Galloway? Yes. Member Johnson? Yes. Okay, Member Mitchell? Yes. Member Nixon? Yes. Okay, Member Olivas? Yes. Member Ralph? Yes. Thank you. That motion passed 7 0. Thank you, Ms. Barela. And that concludes item R. And we can go ahead and move on to section 12, uh, meeting with council regarding pending litigation or personnel issues, closed discussion and possible action regarding pending litigation or personnel matters. Uh, item A, limited personnel matters pursuant to NMSA 1978 section 10-15-1H2, uh, one executive director performance appointment and contract. Do you have a motion to move into closed session? So moved. Motion in a second. Any discussion? Ms. Barella, could we please get a roll call vote to move into closed session? Member Armio Pruitt? Yes. Member Galloway? Yes. Member Johnson? Member Johnson? I'm sorry, yes. Thank you. Member Mitchell? Yes. Thank you. Member Nixon? Yes. Thank you. Member Olivas? Yes. Member Ralph? Yes. Thank you. And that passed seven zero. Okay. Thank you. The board is now in closed session. Um, a, Attorney Gooch and Kuntz.
Thank you for joining us this evening. This is a meeting of the City of Albuquerque Civilian Police Oversight Agency Board. We are completing uh, our closed session item. Uh, this was a meeting with council regarding pending litigation or personnel issues, closed discussion and possible action regarding pending litigation or personnel issues, section A, limited personnel matters pursuant to NMSA 1978 section 10-15-1H2, uh, executive director performance appointment and contract, no items not noticed in this section were discussed during the closed session. Do we have a motion to move into close uh, into open session? <clears throat> so moved. Second. Motion and a second. Any discussion? Ms. Barela, could we please get a roll call vote? Yes. Member Armio Pritt? Yes. Thank you. Member Galloway? Yes. Member Johnson? Yes. Member Mitchell? Yes. Member Nixon? Yes. Member Olivas? Yes. Get Member Ralph? Yes. That motion passed seven zero. Thank you. Uh, okay, and then our next item on the agenda uh, is also a closed session, uh, closed discussion item and possible action regarding pending litigation or personnel matters. Uh, section B matters subject to the attorney attorney client privilege pertaining to threatened or pending litigation in which the public body is or may become a participant pursuant to NMSA 1978 section 10-15-1H7. Item one, Miller v. City of Albuquerque et al. D202-CV-2021-02444. Do we have a motion to move into closed session for this item? So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Ms. Barela, could we please get a roll call vote to move into closed session? Member Armio Pritt? Yes. Thank you. Member Galloway? Yes. Member Johnson? Yes. Member Mitchell? Yes. Member Nixon? Yes. Member Olivas? Yes. Member Rowell? Yes. Thank you. That motion passed 7 0. The board's now in closed session.
Thank you and welcome back. This is a meeting of the City of Albuquerque Civilian Police Oversight Agency Board. Uh, we are leaving closed discussion and possible action regarding pending litigation or personnel issues. Section B, matters subject to the attorney-client privilege pertaining to threatened or pending litigation in which the public body is or may become a participant pursuant to NMSA 1978 section 10-15-1H7. Uh, Item one, Miller v. City of Albuquerque et al. D202-CV-2021-02444. This was the only item discussed in this session and no action was taken. Do we have a motion to move out of closed session? So moved. Second. Motion and a second. Seeing no discussion, Ms. Barela, could you please call the roll? Sorry, Mayo Pruitt? Yes. Member Galloway? Yes. Member Johnson? Yes. Member Mitchell? Yes. Member Nixon? Yes. Member Olivas? Yes. Member Ralph? Yes. Thank you. That motion passed 7 0. Thank you, Ms. Barella. That takes us to our final item tonight. Uh, other business? Members of the board, any other business? Um, and Vice Chair Galloway? Just one thing. Um, uh, tomorrow is our outreach. Community Outreach Liaison or Community Engagement Specialist, I think is her title, it's her last day with us. Um, and so uh, I think it's important that we acknowledge and thank Amanda for her service to the agency and to the board. Um, I've been privileged to work with her for most of the last four years that I've been on the board um, and wish her luck as Nicole's new Director of Operations. Thank you for, for reminding us of that. And, uh, and certainly I think we all appreciate her service. Other, other, other business. Seeing no members raising hands, going once. That takes us to uh, our next regular ske regularly scheduled meeting of the CPOA board will be on July 8th at 5 p.m. Uh, location at this point, uh, possibly to be determined, but possibly in city council chambers. Do we have a motion to adjourn? So moved. So, second. Motion and a second. Seeing no discussion, Ms. Barella, will you please call the roll? Yes. Member Amio Pruitt? Yes. Member Galloway? Yes. Member Johnson? Yes. Member Mitchell? Yes. Member Nixon? Yes. Member Olivas? Yes. Member Ralph? Yes. That motion is 7 0. 7 0. Thank you. Thank you. This meeting is adjourned. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you.